This is Radio Four. We present the first in Victor Pemberton's trilogy, Our Family. Trains don't stop here anymore. A love story for radio by Victor Pemberton, with Nerys Hughes, Nigel Anthony, Wendy Richard, and Sheila Grant. The trains don't stop here anymore. you talk such utter nonsense, just like your father. Mother, why doesn't father ever come down to the shelter with us? How many times do I have to tell you, Nicky? Your, your father stays at home because... Well, oh, because he's not scared of bombs. But neither am I. So why can't I stay behind with him? Mind the games, please! Oh, no. <laughs> not again. <laughs> Why is it that whenever the lower classes are faced with a crisis, they always have to say, well, Oh, it'll be so wonderful when the war's over and the family can all be together again. Ever since they took Tom off to the front, I've been so scared of what might happen to him. I've told you before, young lady, I do not want your brother's name mentioned in my presence. Mother, that's a terrible thing to say. Tom could be killed at any moment. Whatever happens to Tom Edgington will be through his own weakness. His father and I gave him every chance in the world. It's not our fault if he decided to go his own way. Tom joined the army because he wanted to fight for his country. He did it so that he could get away from home. Away from me, his own mother. He could have had everything. But now look at him, a common foot soldier. Tom had to do something for himself, mother. You should be proud of him. Tom loves you, Mother. I know he does. All clear! All clear! For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Amen. Please, Father, can I have some gravy over my Yorkshire pudding, please? You'll wait your turn, young man. Ladies first. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, Father, I'm not very hungry today. I'll just have some meat. No vegetables. Well, what's the matter with you, child? Are you ill or something? She's very restless these days, William. I noticed it in church this morning. I'm not ill, Father. I just don't want to put on too much weight, that's all. Too much weight? A girl of your age? You're forgetting I'll be 18 on the 8th of July. More like 118. Ow! That, that, that's enough, you two. Letty, have you been seeing that Webster boy again? Uh, who, Mother? Don't play the innocent with me, Miss. Don't think I didn't notice he was in church this morning. I'm sorry, Mother. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, no potatoes, thank you, Father. Give her potatoes, cabbage and Yorkshire pudding. Yes, but if she's not hungry, Beatrice... Allow me to know what is best for my own daughter, if you please, William. Take the plate, Betty. But, Mother, I don't want to. Do as I say, please. In future, you're not to see that Webster boy again. Now, do I make myself perfectly clear, young lady? Why, Mother, what's wrong with him? What's wrong? Are you aware that he comes from a family who made their money in the rag and bone trade in the East End of London? What difference does that make? Ronnie's just a nice boy, that's all. I don't want to hear any more about him, thank you. 
Don't worry, Mother. You won't. Ronnie took the King's shilling yesterday. What do you mean? He signed on for the army? Yes, Father. But that boy can't be more than 16 years old. Like all the rest of them, he lied about his age. Yes, you know, the other day I was passing the recruiting office at the church hall. There was a long line of them, queued up in the rain outside. Boys. Hello? Anyone at home? Yes. Oh, Tom, in here, Tom. Oh, Tom, Tom in here. Here. Sit in down. Here. I will not have my table disturbed in the middle of the meal. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Sorry to barge in like this. Tom, oh, Tom, I never thought I'd see you again. I thought you were dead. Let me look at you. You've grown a moustache. You're so thin, Tom. Just look at you. You're growing up fast, Letty. You're at least two inches taller than when I last saw you. Tom. Tom, my dear boy. Hello, Father. It's good to see you again, sir. I see you have a new maid. Her name's Rosie. She has false teeth. <laughs> she thought I was a burglar. <laughs> well, why didn't you write, my boy? It's been so long. Yes, well, I'm sorry about that, sir, but you... You see, well, where I've just come from, there wasn't really much time to write letters. How many of the Bosch did you kill, Tom? I bet it was thousands. <laughs> Not quite as many as that, Nick. Well, how long are you home for, son? Uh, just seven days, sir. Seven days? But you've been away for months. We leave for France again on Saturday night. Things seem to be hotting up out there. Mm. Of course, I, I could stay on at the barracks if it's not convenient. Huh? Stay at the barracks? Don't be absurd, my boy. This is your home. You're welcome to stay for as long as you like. Isn't that so, my dear? Beatrice? I'll get Rosie to prepare your room. Thank you, Mother. It's good to be home again. Good. Then may I take it you will be discarding that uniform before joining us at the dinner table? Lady Tom, the last time you took me out in this lake, I was still at school. Nicky was with us. Yeah, that's right. I seem to remember splashing you both with the oars or something. <laughs> you certainly did. I had to go home and change my dress. It was so wet. Mother was furious. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible brother I've been. No, Tom. Don't ever say that. In fact, you're the best brother anyone could ever have. If anything should ever happen to you, I, I wouldn't want to go on living. Letty Edgington, don't ever let me hear you say such stupid things like that. Look. When the war's over, we'll both be going our own separate ways because, well, because that's the way life is. I've got a lot of things I want to do, people to meet, places to go to. But you, Letty, well, you're different. You're someone with so much capacity for love. You, you have so much to give. Believe me, one of these days you're going to find a nice young bloke who'll take care of you. <laughs> me, get married? Oh, don't you want to get married and have kids of your own? <laughs> of course I do. But do you really think Mother will ever allow that to happen? She'll never let me go, Tom. You see, she's working out all her frustrations on me because she knows Father doesn't love her anymore. Do they still quarrel with each other? <sighs> night after night I lay awake listening to the two of them fighting in their room. It's hard to believe that they ever loved each other. Oh, husbands and wives quarrel, Letty. It's part of married life. Father has a mistress. Did you know? Is what? Mother thinks I don't know, but I do. I've known for a long time. Ever since Father first refused to come down to the shelter with us during the air raids. Do you know who the woman is? Oh, yes. It's Amy Lyle, in the pawnbrokers at the end of our street. She was divorced about a year ago. Amy Lyle? But she must be all of 20 years younger than Father. I'm sure Father has his own reasons. Oh, God, Letty. If only I'd known you were going through all this. Oh, it's not myself I care about. It's Mother. She can't help being what she is. Sometimes I feel so sorry for her. Sorry? For a woman who treats her children the way she does? You know, I still haven't forgotten the time she slapped you across the face for nothing at all. Oh, she's found more subtle ways of hurting me these days. Like sending me to work in the paint factory. You mean that was her idea? It all happened because I mentioned that the great ambition in my life was to become a shorthand typist. But Mother wouldn't hear of it. She seems to resent the idea of me being able to use my own mind. Oh, Tom. What am I going to do with my life? 
I'll tell you what you're going to do, Letty. For once in your life, you're going to make a decision of your own. A shorthand typist? It's out of the question. I've already made my position perfectly clear to your sister. Letty is not suited to a clerical post. But, Mother, how can you say that when you haven't even given her the chance to prove herself? Young man, I decide what is right for my children, not you. Oh, Mother, be reasonable. Look, Letty is a fine, intelligent girl. Give her the chance and she'll make you proud of her. Let her go to that typing school. I'm sorry, but my mind is made up. At the end of next week, Letty will be leaving her present position. I've arranged for her to start work at the Woolwich Arsenal. Do what? Yes. I thought that idea might appeal to you. It will give your sister the opportunity to mix with some of those fascinating people from the lower classes that you both admire so much. No, Mother, I won't let you do it. Stand out of my way, sir. You cannot put that girl to work in a munitions factory. I won't let you. There have been too many accidents. People have been killed there. May I remind you that this war is not of my choice, either. We must all be prepared to make sacrifices. Isn't that what you've always said, Thomas? Now, for the last time, will you let me pass? Mother, let me tell you something. You were right. I did leave this house to get away from you. <laughs> and you know why? Because I despise what you are. And I despise everything that you've ever done to this no, family. No, so please don't say any more. You know, please. Mother, the world I is full you. of little people <laughs> like you. Little in mind and little in heart. One day, you're going to need your children around you. But when that time comes, it'll be too late. Oh, no, so I'm going up to my room now. When I come down again, I shall not expect to find you in this house. Oh, no. It's all right, Letty, love. There's nothing to worry about. It's all over now. But I won't let her send you away, Tom. I won't. I promise you, Letty, she's the one that's going to regret all this, not you. Don't you realise what she's done? She's tried to make you weak. But you're going to be strong, Letty. Strong. Don't go, Tom. Please don't leave me. Letty, one of these days the war's going to be over. It won't be long now. A few months, maybe. And when that happens, the first thing I'm going to do is come back and take you away from all this. Oh, Tom, will you? Will you really do it? Oh, look at you, you silly thing. Great big tears rolling down your cheeks. Oh, come on now, Letty. Don't let me go away remembering you like this. Look, try and think of the times when we were kids together. The good times, Letty, eh? Not the bad ones. What is it you've always said to me? Every cloud... Has a silver lining. Every cloud has a silver lining. Yes. That's my little sister. <laughs> And we are still going to be friends, aren't we? What are you talking about? Of course we are. Yes, of course we are. Nobody can ever take that from us, Letty. Nobody. When this ruddy war is over Oh, how happy I shall be When this ruddy war is over And we come back from Germany Well, I don't care what you say, Letty. A munitions factory is no place for a girl like you to be working in. You're a square pig in a round hole. Anyone can see that. Don't be so silly, Vi. We've all got to do our bit to end the war, haven't we? Though, I must say... I often dread what'll happen to all these bullets and shells we're making. We're at war, and if we don't kill the bush first, it's our boys that'll suffer. <sighs> yes, I know, but it still seems so wrong to have to kill. See what I mean? You just don't belong in a place like this. I mean, just look around you. There must be hundreds of girls slaving their guts out in this dump, but they're none of them like you, Letty. We're all used to manual work. You're not. You're talking absolute nonsense, Vi. I'm as capable of doing a hard day's work as anyone here. That's not what I'm saying and you know it. You know as well as I do, the only reason you're in here is because that old cow of a mother wants to get her own back on you. She ought to be chained to a cart horse, that one. Vi, I wish you wouldn't talk about my mother like that. You know I don't like it. I don't care. That woman's just not letting you get enough out of life. I mean, just look at you. You don't even wear makeup. 
don't like makeup. It's all right for you. You don't need no makeup with skin like you've got. But I still say you should have a nice young man of your own, Letty. You don't get out to meet people. When my brother Tom comes back from the war, I'll meet all the people I want. A brother is not a boyfriend, Letty. And anyway, for all you know, he might be laying dead at the bottom of some trench by now. Don't you dare say such things to me, Vi Hobbs. Do you hear? Don't you dare! Oh, I'm sorry, Letty. I didn't... I didn't mean... I'm sorry. Look, I was wondering... How would you like to come and meet my brother sometime? Your brother? Yeah. His name's Ollie. That's short for Oliver. He's in the army, same regiment as your Tom. They sent him back from France with a bad wound on one of his legs. Ollie don't talk much, but you'd like him. Where is he now? He's in a serviceman's hospital over in Richmond. Oh, why don't you come there with me next Sunday? No, no, I don't think so, Vi. I mean, I don't even know your brother. That's all the more reason why you should come. Or it'd be a tonic for him to see a pretty face for a change. He's fed up with the sight of my physic, I can tell you. Oh, come on now, mate. It'll do him a lot of good, you know. In fact, it'll do you both a lot of good. Oliver... Oliver, wake up. Oliver, wake up, will you? Private Ob? Sure. Oh, what, what, what is it? What's up? Oh, it's you, boy. I must say, I'm very flattered. Every time I come to visit you, you're always fast asleep. I hope you don't snore like that when you find yourself a wife. Oh, I'm sorry, boy. I must have just dropped off for a few seconds. Ollie, I've brought you a visitor. This is a friend of mine who works with me in the factory. Letty, I'd like you to meet my brother, Oliver. Ollie, this is Letty Edgington. Oh, uh, pleased to meet you, Letty. I'm pleased to meet you too, Oliver. Uh, I'm sorry to hear you've had all this trouble. Oh, it's not all that bad, really. Anyway, I'm feeling a lot better than I was. Mum sent you some biscuits. They're your favourite. I don't like digestives. Why not? I do. Then what are you bringing me for? <laughs> <gasps> That's just typical of you, Oliver Robs. Always so ungrateful. You'd never think there was a food shortage the way you carry on. God, I'm so thirsty I could hardly spit two airs. Um, do they still have that tea urn outside? Yeah, as far as I know. What about you, Letty? Would you like a cup? Let me go, Vi. Not on your Nelly. You don't think I want to stay here with this one, do you? Not in the mood he's in. Keep an eye on him, Letty. If he gives you any treat, give him a faulty one. I won't be a jiff. Um, bye. I wouldn't bother if I was you, Letty. What she really means is she's off to chat up one of the doctors she fancies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, why don't you sit on the edge of the bed? Uh, I'm afraid they don't provide any chairs for visitors in this place. Oh, no. It's quite all right, thanks. I don't mind standing. It was very good at... Your... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Letty, you first. Oh, well, I was only going to ask if your leg hurts very much. Oh, no, not really. I've uh, forgotten all about it. Well, almost. How did it happen? Oh, come on now, a nice girl like you don't want to hear about things like that. Oh, but I do, honest I do. I'm not squeamish, I promise you. Well, it was um, in this battle up front. We was fighting round this river, see, um, river called the Somme, <clears throat> and um, my platoon, well, we sort of went on the attack, and uh, Fritz threw everything he got at us, and I, uh, I, I got hit by a shell. Shell? Oh, I, I didn't know much about it. I, it was all over so quick, you see. It wasn't until I woke up and found this great big gash in my leg that I... No, I, I, I didn't know much about it. I, I suppose you could say that I was one of the lucky ones. Lucky? Well, I, I survived, didn't I? Which is more than I can say for the rest of me mates who was with me. The same shell killed the old bleeding lot of them. I'm so sorry, Oliver. I shouldn't have made you talk about it. Oh, that's all right, Letty. You don't have to apologise to me. You know, I don't think I've ever met anyone called Letty before. Oh, it's 
not my real name. I was christened Elizabeth, but my friends at school used to call me Betty, and that sort of became, well, Letty. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, Letty, you're a real good looker. Oh, get away with you. Well, it's true, I tell you. <laughs> Handsome man like you must have lots of girlfriends. None of them are patch on you. I mean it. <laughs> Letty, will you come and visit me again next Sunday? Will you? You're not going to turn me down, are you? I'm sorry, Oliver. I have to. Why? Don't you like me? Oh, don't be silly. It's not that. It's just... Well, we hardly know each other, do we? Well, what difference does that make? Oh, I'll get it. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Letty. I shouldn't have asked. What do you mean? Well, it's a nerve, me expecting someone like you to come and visit me. I mean, we come from different worlds, don't we? As long as people are nice to each other, what does it matter who they are or where they come from? Really, it makes me so angry the way people keep going on and about... you've got blue eyes. Pardon? Bright blue. I haven't seen that colour since I went over to France. They're the same colour as the seawater. On a fine day, of course. How tall are you, Letty? How tall? Um, why, well, I don't know... About five feet five inches, I think. I'm nearly six foot. Or at least I am when I'm standing on two good feet. Uh, I think I'd better go and see if I can find Vi. Visiting time's nearly over. Ah. Oliver! Oh. Oliver, what is it? Is it your leg? Oh. Hold on, Oliver. I'll get the nurse. No, 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 no. Don't do that. I'll be all right in a minute. Yeah. 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 Oh. No, it's getting better. It's getting better a little bit each day. It won't, won't be long. Won't be long now. Oh, what am I talking about? Of course, I'm not getting better. I'm never going to get better. No. It's true, I tell you. I'm going to be stuck inside this bloody hospital for the rest of my life. That's not true. And you know it. If you want to get better, then you'll get better. But you mustn't give up trying. You must make the effort. Make the effort. All you expect me to do, laying flat on me back, day in, day out, in this bed. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I had no right to talk to you like that. I'll do anything I can to help you, Oliver. Anything at all. You mean it? You really mean it? Of course. Well, then come back and see me again next Sunday. Will you, Letty? Please. Letty? Letty, are you awake? Of course I'm awake. What do you want, Nick? I get so scared when Mother and Father carry on like that. Why do they have to fight all the time? Oh, we mustn't pay too much attention to it, Nick. They'll have forgotten everything by the morning. They might, but I won't. Everyone has a quarrel at some time in life, Nick. It's just that... Well, some people don't know how or when to stop. What's happened? Shh! It's Father. He's coming upstairs. Letty, are you... Nicky, what are you doing in here? Uh, uh... Go back to your own room at once, please. Yes, Father. And Nicky? Yes, Father? Look, I want you... I want you to be a good boy. Do you understand? Yes, Father. I don't mean only for now, Nicky. I mean for always. Will you promise? Yes, sir. I promise. Good night, son. Good night, Father. Father, what is it? What's happened? Letty, you're a young woman now. I, I think you're old enough to understand what I have to say. Look, your mother and I can't live with each other anymore, Letty. We're, we've decided to go our own separate ways. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you, Letty? Of course I understand. But what do you expect me to say, Father? If two people don't love each other anymore... Oh, believe me, then... Letty, it's not that your mother and I don't love each other anymore. But when two people have lived together for as long as we have, well... Marriage begins to need an awful lot of hard work. One of these days you'll know what I mean by that. Are you going to live with... with... with that woman friend of yours? Don't... 
resent me, Letty. I promise you, if I could have avoided what I don't happened... resent you, Father. I couldn't. But if only you could realise what it's been like for us this last year or so. It isn't easy to watch your own mother and father tear each other apart. Oh, Letty. Take care of your mother. She's going to need you. But if you're ever in trouble, I want you to promise you'll come and see me. Now, do you understand that, Letty? I can't cry for you, Father. I can't cry for your mother. I only wish I could. You know, Letty, when you were a little girl, I used to think you were growing up far too shy and weak to cope with the problems we all have to face up to. But I was wrong. Goodbye, Letty. Father! She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. Is it true, Letty? Is what true? Well, these daisy petals say you love me. Oh, stop being so silly, Oliver. You know I do. Yes. You do, don't you? I, I, I can't understand it. What's that supposed to mean? Well, how long have we known each other now? Mm, must be nearly six months now. Six months. Do you know something? Every Sunday afternoon, I can't wait to see your face peering through those gates at the end of the ward. You're the first visitor in every time. Of course I am. After all, we only get an hour together. Yeah, but... What I mean is I... I, I never knew I'd ever look forward to seeing anyone so much. I, I, I never knew that... Well, I, I'd actually get to love someone. Well, if you feel like that, Oliver Hobbs, isn't it about time you did something about it? Did something about it? You could start by making an honest woman out of me. Making it? Letty, you, you, you don't... Get married, you, you and me? Well, thank you very much. I must say you make it sound very romantic. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. Oh, oh Letty, don't make fun of me. Make fun of you? Why should I do that? Well, don't you see... It couldn't work, not in a million years. I mean, just look at me. Can you really imagine yourself spending the rest of your life with a cripple? Say that to me once more, Oliver Hobbs, and I swear I'll push you and your wheelchair straight into that lake over there. <sighs> oh, Wally, the wound in your leg is healing. You'll be out of this hospital in no time. But what are we going to live on? I, I've never been able to get a job till I can walk again. I've got a job, haven't I? I know it's not much, but it could keep us going until you're fit and well again. I'm not having no wife of mine to support me. Oh, well, of course, if you don't want to marry me, I'm not going to force you. Oh, don't be angry with me, Letty. I, I don't like it when you're angry. It makes me feel... Well, well, guilty. Look, Golly, if you don't want to accept the responsibility of a wife and family, then there's nothing I can do about it, is there? No, Letty, you've got it all wrong. Of course I'd like to marry you. Well, I, I'd be the luckiest man alive to have a girl like you at my side. But don't you realise what you'd be letting yourself in for? Someone like me wouldn't stand a chance of getting work. Of course you wouldn't if you didn't try. Well, it might be years before I can throw away these crutches. I never got this far if been for you. What you've done, you've done through your own willpower. And that's the way it's got to be, Ollie. Believe me, Ollie, when you walk out of this hospital, it'll be on your own two feet. Oh, there's a cold nip in the air. I hate autumn. It smells of bonfires and the end of summer. Come back here, Letty. What for? What have you got there? Well, it's a buttercup. They say if you hold a buttercup under someone's chin... You can tell if they like butter. Well, you won't find out much from me. I haven't had so much as a taste of butter since before the war. Now, come on. Lean back your head. Oh, Molly, don't be silly. There you are. What did I tell you? Just look at that yellow reflection. Pass me my crushes, Letty. 
I want to stand up. No, it's too soon. You know what the doctor said. Ah, to hell with the doctor. You're not pushing me back into that hospital again in no wheelchair. Oh, stop being so obstinate. No. Oh, Ollie, no. Oh, oh, oh. Ollie. Ollie, are you all right? Are you hurt? Oh, come on, let me give us a kiss. No, Ollie, somebody might see him. Mm-mm. Shall I tell you something? You've got a mind of your own, Lady Edgington. I can see it's going to cost me a fortune to keep you in butter. Mary, my daughter. Young man, have you taken leave of your senses? I love Letty, Mrs. Edgington. She loves me. So why shouldn't we spend the rest of our life together if we both feel the same way? I promise you I'll take good care of her. Marriage needs a great deal more than love, Mr. Hobbs. That I can assure you. Tell me... How would you intend to support my daughter? As soon as he's feeling better, Ollie's hoping to get his old job back on the underground. The underground? Do you mean the tube trains, by any chance? Yeah, well, I'm hoping to be, um... Well, a, t- a ticket collector. Ticket collector? It's a good, sound job, Mother. You have to know a lot about fares and routes and things. Isn't that so, Ollie? No, I'd better go, Letty. No, Ollie, don't let her bully you. That's just what she wants. We're wasting our time, Letty. And go on talking till the cows come on, but you'll never get rid of people's prejudices. You know, Mrs. Edgington, it's a funny thing. My old ma feels exactly the same as you about all this. Well, thank God we share something in common. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have other things to attend to. Mother, it may interest you to know that whether you give your permission or not, Oliver and I intend to go ahead and get married. Young lady, are you aware that you are still under age to be married without your parents' consent? If I don't get that consent, I promise you that as soon as I reach the age of 21, I shall leave you and never talk to you again as long as I live. Mother? Out of here, Nicky, out. But, Mother, a boy brought this to the door. He says it's out. Get out! It's a telegram, Mother. Give it to me, Nick. Now, be a good boy and wait for us in the kitchen. Yes, Letty. The Secretary of State for War regrets to inform you that... It's Tom. He's been killed in action. Don't leave me, Letty. You can't leave me, not now. I need you. Everyone keeps thinking me so funny. I've got feelings too, you know. Of course you have. Anyway, he can make his lucky stars. He's found himself a nice girl like you. Here I can tell you, I wouldn't want to put up with his clever talk for the rest of me life. I don't know, Vi. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've done too bad for myself. Come on, Vi. What's your moping about in the corner for? Here, yeah, come and have a knees up with me. A knees up? do no knees up. Not in this dress. It's too tight. <laughs> oh, no, it is. What do you think I asked you for? Oh, <laughs> you Brooks, you're becoming bold in your own day. Oh, my God. Oh, come on, boy. Right. Hey, let me. Come outside in the passage. I want to talk to you. Why, Lee? What do you want? I want a minute alone with my own wife, if you don't mind. <laughs> It is hot in there. 
You are my honey, honeysuckle. <laughs> Happy, Mrs. Hobbs. What do you think, Mr. Hobbs? Mustn't be long. Late isn't sociable. Oh, I'm sorry it weren't no fancy wedding, Letty. I promise I'll make it up to you one day. What are you talking about? It was a lovely wedding. Ah, uh, no, it wasn't. There's no organ playing or church bells. No bridesmaids or wedding cake. Just look at that bit of brass on your finger. It ain't worth a light. Ollie, you could put a curtain ring on my finger. It'd mean just as much. Believe me, I've nothing to regret about today. Nothing. Except... Ah, oh, so there is something. No, no, I was just thinking, well... I wish your mother and father could have been at the church this morning. It would have made so much difference. Nah, not really. It's no good, Letty. You can't put feelings where there aren't none. Anyway, they sent us a car. That's more than I expected. Must say, I feel the same way about my own mother. Oh, I suppose it's too much against her pride to show up at her own daughter's wedding, but somehow, somehow I kept hoping that she might be there. She was there. What? And your mother was there, Letty. I saw the old girl myself. She was hiding at the back of the church just as you arrived. Ollie, is this true? Well, you can ask Bill Brooks. He saw her too. She's crying her eyeballs out when we left the church together. Then she ran off before I could do anything about it. Oh, God. She was there. She was really there. Oi, come on now, you two lovebirds. You're too early for the anky-panky just yet, you know. Come on, back inside. Come on. <laughs> Time to raise your glasses to the happy couple. Right, now, everybody tucked up? No, no, yeah. hang about. All right, ready? <clears throat> yeah. That's right. I'll give you the toast to two of the nicest people you could ever wish to know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, things ain't been too easy for them, we know. And it's no use pretending it's going to get much better for a time yet. But uh, but what we can do for them here tonight is to, to assure them that they have friends they can really rely on. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, while they've got friends, they ain't never going to need for nothing. Yeah. Uh, and so, ladies and gents, boys and girls, <laughs> I'll give you the toast. To the bride and groom, God bless them. To Letty and Oliver Hobbs. Letty, 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 Letty and Oliver Hobbs. Come on, Letty, you know how to speak. You say something. Go on. No, Ollie, I can't. It's the man's supposed to make the speech, not me. No, it's no use, Letty. I can't do it. I just, I can't. I can't do it. Silence, please. Silence. Shh, shh, Lady, ladies and gentlemen, Oliver and I, well, well, we just wanted to thank you all for coming to our wedding today. August the 4th, 1918 is a day I'll remember for the rest of my life. It's funny to think that it's exactly four years to the day since the war started. But like all of you, Ollie and I have got a lot of things we want to do in our future years. And when the war ends, I hope Mr Lloyd George will see to it that this country becomes a fit place for our boys to live in again. Because that's what they fought for, isn't it? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say is that when we're living in the future, I hope none of us will ever be too busy to remember the past. Letty, Letty. Letty, there's someone here to see you. Who is it? Look for yourself. It's me, Letty. Mother. Well, I, I'm sorry if I'm butting in, Letty. Oh, you're not <coughs> butting in. Is she, Ollie? No, of course not. You're very welcome, Mrs. Edgington. Well, all I wanted to say was... If you and Oliver don't have anywhere to stay until you have a place of your own, you're welcome to have your old room back. Well, for as long as you like. Thanks all the same, Mother, but... Bill and Tilly here have been putting me up for the past few months. Ollie and I are going to stay on with them for a bit. Oh, well, that's all right, then. I, I just thought I'd make sure. Well, I'll be on my way, then. God bless you, Letty. 
Do you two worry about D- Don't go, Mum. Um, why don't you stay on for a bit? No, I, I don't. I don't think I no, Unless you would like it, uh, so would I. Come on, now. You know, somebody get Mrs. Edgerton a glass of shit. Yeah, come and meet everyone, Mum. Uh, that's my sister, Violet, over there. Hello. Then there's Purse and Reen. And this is Bill and Teddy Brooks. Uh, Bill's an old pal of mine. We was at school together. <laughs> a ball still more like yeah. it. <laughs> uh, come on now, everybody. Get yourself stoked up for a sing-song. Oh, uh, any volunteers for a tinkle on the old Joanna? Over here, Bill. My mother can play the piano. Oh, oh no. I couldn't. Oh, yes. I haven't got my music sheets oh, with me. Oh, come on now, Mrs. Edgerton. Fill yourself up with a glass of Mother's Ruin and you'll be well away. <laughs> well, there is one song I can play without my ah, music sheets. Oh. But I warn you all, I am a little rusty. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Pray silence for our star turn of the evening, Ma Edgerton. <laughs> Just a song at twilight When the lights are low And the flickering shadows Softly come and go Do the heart be weary Sad the day and long Still to Palace, mind you. <laughs> but with a coat of distemper here and there, I'd say you could turn this into a really nice little room. Previous tenants thought the world of this place never left it till they carried her out in her box. Well, Mr Hobbs, what do you think? Oh, I'm not sure, Mr Cotton. <sighs> Smells a bit, huh? Yeah, well, uh, that's the damp, you see. Hasn't been lived in since the old lady died. Still a nice coal fire in the evenings will soon put that right. But what about the little wife? What do you think, Mrs Hobbs? How often do the trains go by, Mr Cotton? Oh, no more than a couple each day at the most. Well, I'd be surprised if... uh... Yeah, well, (laughs) there used to be an old railway station on the line at the back of this house. But it hasn't been used since the war broke out. Something to do with economy cuts, I heard. But I promise you, Mrs Sobs, you won't have no trouble with no noise. Ah, no, not here. See, the trains don't stop here anymore. Oh, I don't worry about the noise. You don't? No, not at all. I like the sound of trains. They give me a feeling of protection. Really now? Well, that's nice. How much do you want for the room, Mr Cotton? Well, now, don't let it be said that Reg Cotton's out to make a quick profit on any young married couple who are trying to set up home for the first How time. How much, Mr Cotton? Shall we say, uh, three and six a week? Uh, you do your own decorating, of course. Three and six? It's a bargain for the area, I'm telling you. I mean, just look at the space you've got. Built-in cupboards over there, chest of drawers, dresser, beautiful double brass bedstead. And just look at this lovely little range oven for the... <laughs> yeah, well, ha. just needs a bolt or two on the oven door. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Letty? It's up to you, Ollie. You make the decisions, not me. Tell you what, why don't I leave you two to have a look around on your own for a couple of minutes? Give you a chance to talk things over in private. Yeah, thanks, Mr Cotton. I'd appreciate that. I'm oh, an honest man, Mr Hobbs. I've never done anybody out of nothing in my whole life. That's the door. Oh, don't worry. Just needs a bit of oil on the hinges, that's all. Yeah, well, ha. Uh... Well, Letty, what are we going to do? Come over to the window, dear. It's a lovely view from here. Oh, there are two steps. Be careful. You call this a lovely view? For three and six a week, it's highway bloody robbery. Now, just look at it out there. We're practically on top of the railway line. Yes, but just think of all those trains that go by and all the places they go to up and down the country. Places you and me will never get the chance to see in our old life. Stop being so pessimistic, Ollie. It costs nothing to dream, does it? This room's a dump, Letty. We can clean it up, can't we? By the time I've finished with this place, it'll be fit for the king himself. Where are we going to get three and six minutes from to pay the rent each week? If 
necessary. I could get a little job to do in the evening. You're not taking on any more jobs, I tell you. As it is, you're working from seven in the morning till six at night in that munitions factory. Look, all I was trying to say was that when the war's over, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't open up that old railway station again. If they did, I bet you'd get a job there as easy as pie. Oh, just imagine it, Ollie. Going to work in your own backyard. My own backyard? Then you mean you want us to take on this room? I want a home for you and me, Ollie. A home, Ollie. Something both you and me have never really had. I want you and me to start building our future together. And if it has to be in a damp barn of a place like this, then it's all right with me. I tell you, it's not right, Letty. You can't keep this up for much longer. Not two jobs in one day, you'll crack up. Oh, don't talk stupid, Vi. I'm not made of cardboard, you know. Yes. Or scrubbing an entire school all on your own every evening. It turns me up just to watch you. I like being here after school hours. It gives me a chance to think. Well, I just hope you know what you're doing, that's all. Now, what do you mean by that, Vi? Look, Letty, I know you're trying to protect Oliver, but you've got to be careful. Careful? Yeah, well, he's a complicated fella. He always has been. Yes, and obstinate. Proud and obstinate. Just like me dad and all me brothers. Look, all I'm saying is that once Oliver starts to feel that he's not a man anymore... He'll turn against you. I know what you mean, Vi, but you're wrong. Once that old railway station at the back of us opens up again, things are going to be different for Ollie and me. He'll have a job of his own and a wife and family to take care of. Family? You don't mean you're going to have kids? Well, of course we are eventually. Don't you want to have children when you get married? <laughs> you must be joking. I hate the little brats. Even give me a turn coming into this school hall. Oh, no, I'll never have no kids of me own. I'll believe that when you find yourself a husband. Uh, yes, well, as a matter of fact, I wanted to talk to you about that, Letty. Um, I was wondering whether I could bring a gentleman friend of mine. Well, uh, well, I'd like you and Ollie to meet him. Why? You've got a new boyfriend. Oh, yes, and he's ever so nice, Letty. I know you'll like him. His name's Frank O'Malley and he's an Irishman. Irish? Uh, well, sort of. He's a scouse, you know, from Liverpool. Oh, I see. Well, I tell you what. Why don't you bring him round to tea on Sunday? I can't promise much in the way of food, but I could get some winkles off the fish man when he calls. Oh, that would be marvellous, Lessie. Uh, well, the only thing is... Well, um, it's not quite as easy as that, you see. The fact is, I know you'd like him, but it's, it's Oliver I'm worried about. Don't be silly, Vi. If you like him, why shouldn't we? You see... Frank doesn't approve of war. Don't be ridiculous, Vi. Do you know anyone who does? No, no, that's not quite what I mean. You see, Frank's done time in prison. He's a pacifist, a conscientious subjector. Anyway, the way I look at it is this. If only Asquith had played his cards right, there'd have been no need for this war. I mean, I tell you, the whole thing's nothing but a political cover-up. Oh, don't be so dull, Frank. What are we supposed to do? Sit down and wait for Kaiser Bill to march down Whitehall? I tell you, the Liberals needed this war. It was the only way they could get rid of unemployment. Well, I don't believe it. Everyone knows that if we hadn't stopped the Bosch, they'd have taken over the whole of Europe. You real German people, Vi. You real German people are human beings, just like the rest of us. I mean, we should have appealed directly to them, not your politicians. Well, what say you, Oliver? I say the only good German is a dead one. Um, who's for some more trifle, Vi? Oh, lovely. Honestly, Letty, you become such a good housewife, you'll have to give me some tips when I get married. If and when anyone decides to ask me. What about you, Frank? <coughs> what? More trifle, Mr O'Malley. Well, oh, oh, uh, no, 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 thank you, no. Very anyway, much. I don't even know what you're going on about, Frank O'Malley. Most people say a war will be over in the next few weeks. <laughs> Not if those old warmongers in Whitehall have anything to do with it. Hey, did you really mean what you said just now, Oliver, about the Germans? I meant every word. Nah. 
I find that very interesting. I mean, how does a man like you justify the taking of a life? I was proud to fight for my country. Most men are, you know. I don't blame you, Oliver. No, I mean, I don't blame anybody for thinking me a coward. I mean, most people do. But at least I stick to me principles. I mean, I don't believe in this war, and that's all there is to it. Nobody believes in war, Mr O'Malley. We'd be poor creatures if we did. Yeah, but if you don't believe in something, Mrs Hobbs, then why don't you condemn it? Because I cherish my freedom, Mr O'Malley. If you take away that, what have you left? Exactly my sentiments, Mrs Hobbs. That's why I'm a socialist. We believe in the right of the individual to say what he wants any time. I'm telling you, it was big business that started this war. Nothing else, you Bloody know. nonsense. Oliver. It's bloody nonsense. He sits there and he talks to me about principles. Well, I've got principles too. I love my country. I was proud to fight for it. All right, dear, all right. There's no need to shout. I am not shouting! I love that pot of geranium over there, Letty. It is a geranium. Now, you tell me something, Mr O'Malley. Would you still refuse to fight if you saw the Bosch marching down your street, depriving you of this so-called freedom you talk about? Freedom? You call this freedom? I mean, is this what you fought for, Oliver? I mean, look at it. This is, is this what you call a soldier's reward from a grateful government? A, a one-room barn of a place with, with, at the side of a railway track? You, you, oh, 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 kill him, no, 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 kill him, no, kill him! You got me all wrong! I'm, 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 I'm a pacifist, not a traitor! You're choking me, Adam Zabble! You're choking leave me! Him, Oliver, leave him alone! What's he going to face? Get this bloody conchie out of my place, get him out! Come on, Frank, we don't want to stay where we're not wanted. But I haven't finished me winkles yet. Hell with your ratty winkles, we're going. And mark my words, Oliver Robs, as long as there's a breath in my body, I'll never set foot inside your place again. Never. But I've finished the god fight. I mean, I don't know what all the fuck is about. Get out. Lady, what are you laughing at? Why aren't you angry? I thought you'd be angry with me. Oh, angry. Oh, my dear Ollie, why should I be angry with you? You give me one of the best evenings I can ever remember. In fact, I don't think I've enjoyed myself so much in years. Hobbs, Mrs. Hobbs. Oh, oh, Mr. Cotton, what are you doing here? I've been looking for you everywhere, Mrs. Hobbs. So I thought the best thing was to catch you as you came out of work. I take it you did receive the note I sent you? Yes. Yes, I did, Mr. Cotton. And I will be paying the rent just as soon as I can. The trouble is that now that my evening job at the school is finished, well, I've had quite a lot of extra expenses to cope with just lately, but I will be settling with you, I promise. Of course you will, Mrs. Hobbs. I know that. But landlords have a lot of overhead expenses, you know. Oh, I do understand, Mr. Cotton, I really do. However, I'm a reasonable man, Mrs. Hobbs, and it's only right that I should show my appreciation for all the hard work you've both done to transform that little room of ours. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cotton. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Good. I... Shall we say seven days, then? Seven days? Yeah, all back payment by Friday next week. Or I'm afraid you and your husband will have to vacate the premises, Mrs. Hobbs. Yes, miss. Can I help you? I'm looking for Mr. Edgington. Mr. William Edgington. Do you have an appointment, miss? Miss Edgington doesn't actually have anything to do with the shop himself. Maybe I could help. Did you have something to pawn? My name's Letty Hobbs. I'm Mr. Edgington's daughter. Letty, my dear child. Hello, Father. Oh, Letty, it's been such a long time since I last saw you. Such a long, long time. <laughs> no, that's not quite true. As a matter of fact, I've watched you come out of the factory several times, but I've never had the nerve to go up and speak to you. Well, how's your husband? Has his wound healed yet? Oliver's as well as can be expected, Father. I'm sorry I couldn't go to your wedding, Letty. I thought it best not to, not under the circumstances. Oh, I quite understand. Oh, Letty, uh, I'm sorry. I want you to meet Amy. Amy's, well, she's a very good friend of mine. Amy, this is my daughter, Letty. Hello, Letty. How do you do, Mrs. Lyle? I am pleased to meet you at last, dear. Your dad's told me so much about you and your brother Tom and young Nicky. Yes. 
I can see the family likeness all right. You've got the same colour eyes as your dad. William, you never told me how pretty she is. <laughs> Father, um, if it's convenient, I'd like to have a few words with you. In private. Yes. Well, I've got quite a lot of work to do outside here in the shop, so why don't the two of you go and make yourselves comfortable in the back parlour? I'll bring you in a nice cup of tea later. Letty, are you in trouble? You said that if ever I was in trouble, I was to come and see you. My dear child. I need money, Father. Oliver hasn't been able to work since he came out of hospital, and now the landlord has given me one week to find the rent. Or we have to give up the room. If that happens, I don't know what I'll do. It's just impossible to find accommodation at the moment. Oh, if and... that's the case, I'll write you a cheque. Now, you take this to my bank and I'll cash it for you immediately. No, Father. No? That's not what I came here for. I want your help, Father, but not your money. I need to raise just enough cash to see us through the next few weeks, that's all. Well, then let me help no, you. No, Father. I want to do this my way. I've brought something to pawn. Let it. Don't be absurd. This is a pawn shop, isn't it? Well, I've got something to pawn. Here. And if you don't mind, the least you say to Mrs. Lyle about this, the better. But this is the brooch your mother and I bought you for your 16th birthday. Yes. So you know how much it's worth. You can't part with that, Letty. I won't let you. A roof over my head is far more important than something to pin to my dress. Besides, it'll only be a temporary measure. As soon as Oliver finds a job, he'll buy the brooch back for me again. Look, Father, if you won't help me, there are plenty of other pawn shops around, you know. <laughs> You're an extraordinary girl, Letty. Proud and independent, just like your mother. All the worst qualities imaginable for not getting on in this world. Give me the brooch. My God, what's that? I don't know. Sounds like the maroon warning signal. An air raid, but it can't be. William, come quick, William. The streets are full of people. Tell me, what is it? What's happened? It's the armistice, William. The armistice. The war's come to an end. It's over, William. The war's over. You come to bed. You go to sleep, dear. I'll be over in a minute. What are you doing? Don't you know what time it is? Penny farthings, penny halfpenny, three farthings. Stuff. I'm trying to work out if we've got enough money to have some sausages for dinner tomorrow. <sighs> uh, always working things out. Always putting pennies away for something or other. That's the only way. If I put a little aside from my wage packet each week, it stops us from getting into debt. Where'd you get the money from, Liddy? What do you mean? Now, come on now, you know what I mean. A couple of weeks ago, we was over a month due on the rent. You must have got it from somewhere. Um, Mr Cotton was very understanding about it. He's agreed to let me pay off what we owe a bit at a time. I don't believe you, Liddy. I don't believe a word you say. Oh, thank you very much. That's a nice thing to say to your own wife. Now, come on now. What did you put in, Hock? Don't be silly, Ollie. Now, now, now come on. Let's get back to bed. No, no. Now, wait a minute. I've got a present for you. A what? Yeah, I bought it for a tailor from Charlie Williams. He said he knows at least three people who've been lucky. Lucky, Ollie? What are you talking about? Yeah. See it for yourself. You'll go on and take it. A sweepstake ticket? Yeah, the draw takes place at the end of November. Well, look at the first prize, Letty. hundred quid. Just think what we could do with under a quid. You, artful devil, you. Don't tell me I've married a gambler. Oh, well, for Christ's sake, it's only a tanner. All right, so I know it's your money, but I'll pay you back. I swear to God, I'll pay you back every penny of it. Oliver, what a terrible thing to say. Oh, don't worry. You don't have to tell me. I oh, know we haven't got a dog's chance of winning no prize. But we have, Ollie, of course we have. And if you want to spend sixpence on a sweepstake ticket, you've got every right to. How many times do I have to tell you what I earn is not my money, it's ours? Now, stop talking so silly and come back to bed. Oh, I don't want to go to bed. 
I can't sleep. So you're just going to stare out of the window and sulk, is that it? Thank you for giving me such a lovely present, dear. Now don't make fun of me, Letty. But I'm not making fun of you. How could I? I love you too much for that. Oh, it looks cold out tonight. Can you see the frost in the moonlight on the railway line? Oh, Ollie. Do you know what I'd like to do if we win that hundred pounds? I'd like you and me to go for a trip on one of those trains. Just imagine all the wonderful places they could take us to. Where would you like to go, Ollie? I don't know. Never thought about it. I'd like to go to the seaside. The seaside? Mm. Then that's what we'll do. We could go to Brighton. Mother and father once took Tom, Nicky and me to Brighton. When we were very young, of course. You'd love Brighton, Ollie. The beach stretches for miles and miles. And there are two piers and lots of places to get a cup of tea. Oh, dreams. Nothing but dreams. Dreams cost nothing. I'm going back to bed. Uh, can I turn off this light? We're wasting the juice. <sighs> Might as well, I suppose. <sighs> oh. Go on, men. <sighs> Move over. Go! Your feet are cold. Then warm them for me. Oh. No, Ollie, don't tickle me. Go to sleep, Liddy. I am, I am. Good night, dear. Good night. <sighs> They say they're going to open up the old railway station at any minute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if they did? After all, they've got to have somewhere to bring the hospital trains to. Since the war ended, there must be thousands of our boys waiting to get back from the front. Go to sleep, Lily. Oh, yes, sorry, dear, sorry, sorry. <sighs> If they did decide to use that train station for the troops, then they'd have to open it up again for good, wouldn't they? I mean, it would prove then that the branch line is worth keeping up, wouldn't it? Oh, Ollie, I don't know what I'd do if it did all happen. Just imagine it. You get a job there as a porter or ticket collector or something, and you could come home for your meals every day, regular as clockwork. Oh, stop it, lady! For ever sake, stop. I don't want to hear another word about the bloody trains. Do you hear? Oliver, what is it? I'm sick to death of you mooning on about that bloody train station. That place is finished, Letty. It's not worth a light. You mustn't lose hope, Polly. They will open that station again. I know they stop will. Stop it, Letty. Stop it, Letty. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> strength. How are we going to get out of this mess, Letty? How? It's all right, Ollie. <coughs> we'll think of something. We will think of something. Listen. What is it? Well, listen. listen. A train. Yes, but it's going past, Ollie, just like all the rest of them. It's going past. No. It, it's stopping, I tell you. It, it's slowing down. You're right, Ollie. It is stopping. It's pulling into the platform. I can see people's faces at the carriage windows. For the first time, I can actually see you. You were right, Lenny. There are troops on board. And nurses. It's a hospital train. It's stopped, Ollie. Of this country, of Adinor! 
four oh. years ago. Do you remember all those promises Lloyd George and his gang tried to fob us off with? Oh. Do a good day's work, they said. And within a few years, the standard of living in this country would be greater than anywhere else in Europe. Oh. Well, brothers, here we are in 1930. And after four years, what have we got? Don't you? I must say, Guy, your thanks speaks very well. You ought to be a politician. Oh, no, thank you. It's bad enough as it is, dragging me and the kids up here to Speaker's Corner every Sunday morning. Did you know, last week someone threw a rotten egg at him. What are you and me, the working people of this country, going to do about it? Let's all go down the strand. I couldn't afford the price of bananas on a means test. Well, brothers, I'll tell you what we're going to do about it. We gave them our answer in 1926, and we'll give it to them again. If this government don't improve the pay and conditions of every working class man and woman in this country, I say we damn trolls. That's it then, back stations. Come on, Letty, this is where you and me make a quick getaway. Follow me. Shut up! Shut up, you snotty-nosed little beast, or I'll feed you to the bleeding ducks. No, Vi, you mustn't talk to me like that. Poor little thing's probably scared out of her life after all that shouting. Here, Sylvie. Come on, you come to your auntie Liz. There you are, then. There's a pretty girl. What? I think she's hungry. Oh, oh she's always bleeding oh. hungry. She'd eat me if she had a chance. Honestly, oh. Fa, I don't know why you bother to have a family if they get on your nerves so much. Oh. Don't you worry. It wasn't my idea. You try marrying a Catholic. Having kids becomes an industry. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be parted with my two, I can tell you. Ever since they were born, it's given Oliver a new lease of life. He simply dotes on them. Really? Well, I'm glad he's turned out to be a better husband than he was a brother. Oliver may not be perfect, but I'm telling you, he's a good man. Oh, I just wish he wasn't always in such pain. Pain? I mean, he's still got trouble with that old leg wound. He's awake night after night with it. Oh, he can move around all right, well, more or less, but it's the pain that keeps nagging away at him all the time. Oh, and you know, Vi, in the last week or so, the wound's become all sort of swollen, and it's turned a kind of bluish colour. Hasn't he seen a doctor or something? He's got an appointment to see a specialist at the hospital on Tuesday morning. Letty, you're a real brick the way you support that man. What are you talking about? Oliver's my husband, isn't he? I've never known such happiness since I met him. Since the kids were born, Ollie's been a changed man, happy-go-lucky, fun to be with. But you know, Vi, more than anything else, he loves his job at the train station. He's so proud of what he's doing, and that's important for a man like him. If they take all that away from him, Guy, he'd feel somehow betrayed. I don't know what he'd do, Vi. I just don't know what he'd do. Tickets, please. All oh, tickets, please. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Hello, Mr. Pearson. Sorry to trouble you. Mrs. Hobbs, what are you doing here? I thought you'd be at the hospital with your husband. Oliver wouldn't let me go with him. He hasn't been home yet, so I thought he must have come straight back to work. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hobbs. I, I haven't seen Ollie all day. Uh, all tickets, please. But it's four o'clock in the afternoon. His appointment at the hospital was for nine this morning. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if it's worth mentioning or not, but, uh, well, on my way to work a couple of hours ago, I thought I saw your husband. He was going into Finsbury Park. The park? Yeah. But he should be at work by now. You know what Ollie's like about the trains? Yeah. Well, I know for a fact he spends a lot of his spare time watching them from the railway bridge there. Like I said, I'm not absolutely certain it was him, but it might be worth a try. Oliver? Oliver, is that you? Oh, Ollie dear, what are you doing out here on the bridge? Go home, lady. I want to be on my own for a bit. But you'll be late for work. You should have been back on the late turn duty by now. Uh I'm not going back to work today. Not going? Look, Letty, I don't want to keep answering no questions, so just leave me alone. Go back up. What happened, Ollie? What did the specialist say? Nothing. 
Don't be silly. He must have said something. Did you ask him about the swelling? What about those tests they did last week? Surely there must be some reason why... It's gangrene. Gangrene? So what does that mean? It means... that my... my bloody leg is rotting away. It means... It means my leg has got to come off. They want to amputate it, just below the kneecap. Oh, God. Ollie. Ollie, my dear. Well, I'm telling you right now, I won't let them do it, you hear? I won't. Are you sure you got it right, Ollie? You know how you get things muddled at times? For God's sake, woman. When someone tells you that they want to cut off a part of your body, you know what they're telling you. Ollie. Let's try and be calm about this for a minute, dear. Let's just try and work this out sensibly. How soon do they want to do it? In the next day or so. They, they say there's a danger of the poison getting into my blood. But I'm not, I'm not going through with it. I'm not for no one. Ollie, you must go yeah, through Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I thought you'd say. It's easy for you, isn't it? You've got two good feet to stand on. God, what am I going to do, lady? <laughs> Ollie, Ollie, dear, please don't, don't, please, for my sake. It's the end of my life. I've got nothing to live for now, nothing. Don't ever let me hear you talk like that. You've got a lot to live for, and don't you forget it. It's me and the kids, and shall I tell you something? I was talking to Mr. Cotton the other day. He says he might be able to rent us a little house in a couple of months or so. Oh, nothing expensive, mind, but at least the kids wouldn't have to sleep on the floor anymore. Think of it, Ollie. A house of our very own. Pearson, the, the station master told me that if I have to go into hospital many more times, he, he, he wasn't sure he could guarantee my job at the station anymore. There'll be plenty of other jobs. In fact, I bet you could get your old job back on the underground if you wanted to. Why, anyone would be glad of the chance of employing someone like you. Someone like me? A cripple with one leg? How am I going to get through this, lately? How? We're going to get through this together, Ollie. You and I. We've got to be strong. I have so much to look forward to, that's why. I want you to live. So let's get on with it, right away. You're a stupid girl, Letty. Sister tells me you've been sitting out here ever since nine o'clock this morning. Well, your being here like this can't help Oliver, you know. Allow me to be the judge of that, if you don't mind, Mother. What are you doing here, anyway? Oh, I just felt like a ride out on the bus, that's all. Would you mind if I sit with you for a bit? Of course not. Have you had any news yet? No. Only that Oliver was in the operating theatre for nearly two hours. The doctors are with him now. I'm just praying that everything's going to be all right. With a lot of courage, Letty. I have to give that to you. Oliver's the one with courage, not me. Well, I'm glad he gets more attention than I do. Not even your brother Nick comes to see me these days. Not since he married that woman of his. Please, Mother, no lectures. I don't feel up to it. I hate hospital corridors. The smell of ether and stale tears. And... Then, for God's sake, why don't you go home? You know you can't bear Oliver. You never could. Oh, really, there's no need to raise your voice at me, Letty. I'm, I'm sorry, Mother. It's just... Uh, I suppose I'm anxious, that's all. I was awake all last night. Wondering what I'll do when I see Oliver for the first time after the operation. I just don't know what I'm going to say to him when I see. I mean, I can't just pretend that his leg's still there. Letty, may I tell you something that happened to me a long time ago? When your father first left me to go off with that girl of his. It was over three years before I could even bring myself to walk past that pawn shop where they lived. 
In fact, I'd cross the street and turn my eyes the other way rather than accept that such a place existed. But one day, I, I never know how or why, I found myself walking right up to the front door of the shop. There was a young woman inside, a man with her. The man was William. I plucked up courage and went in. William couldn't believe his eyes. For a moment we just stared at each other. And then I smiled and I found myself saying, William, I just wanted to tell you that I wish you well. And he took my hand and kissed it and then introduced me to Amy Lyle and... We all had tea together. It was a delightful afternoon. I never made any effort to see your father again, right up to the time when he died last year. But I'm glad I saw him that once. I think he was too. Mrs. Hawkes, <gasps> oh, you can come in now. But only a few minutes, please. Your husband's still a bit groggy from the operation. Thank you, sister. Oh, Letty, when you see Oliver, will you give him this, please? It's, it's nothing much, really. It's a small bottle of whiskey to cheer him up, that's all. I remember he once told me he drinks the stuff. Tell him... Oh, just tell him I wish him well. I must say, you're living it up in style here, all right, Ollie. The other beds are empty. You've got the whole room all to yourself. Hey, Ollie, I've got some news for you. You know that musical comedy actress you like? You know the one I mean? That pretty girl, what's her name? Jessie Matthews? Well, she's going to open that new picture house at Finsbury Park. When you're up and about again, we'll have to try a couple of pennies of dark, though, won't we, Ollie, eh? You're going to be all right, Ollie. The doctors are very pleased with you. Half a man, Betsy. That's all that's left of me now, half a man. Half a man's better than no man at all. Come on now. You know what they say? Every cloud... Has a silver lining. Yes, so I've heard. How the kids? They're fine. Just fine. Violet's looking after little Eddie for me today, and Robbie... Oh... You wait till you see Ronnie. He's painting you a new picture for when you get home. Oh, oh, I almost forgot. They sent you some licorice all sorts. They're your favourites. When I was on that table up there, I dreamt about the kids. They were running all over the place, but I, I couldn't catch them. I don't want them to see me looking this way, Letty, not ever. Heard such nonsense. Didn't I tell you this is a change, that's all? As far as I'm concerned, you're still that handsome soldier boy I married 12 years ago. I want you to leave me, Letty. I want you to take the kids away and forget all about me. Ollie, what a terrible thing to say. Oh, I mean it, Letty. I can't bear the thought of you all... Seeing me hobble around on one leg for the rest of my life. You won't have to hobble around, Ollie. The sister was telling me they make the most wonderful artificial legs these days. In a few months from now, you'll be right back to normal again. You know, you can't keep crossing a road to avoid a shop you don't want to go into. Hey? Eh? Just something my mother said, that's all. Now, don't move, Ollie. I'm going to pull back the bed clothes. No, no. It's all right, dear. I, I just want to see what they've done to you. No, no. Ollie? Ollie? Will you do me a favour, please, dear? From now on, will you let me be your other leg? I promise you it'll be as firm as rock. <laughs> Some of our sing songs together. 
Hey, Holly, what's your favourite song? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I bet I do. Remember that song you used to sing to me soon after we first met? How does it go now? You are my honey, honeysuckle. I am a bee. I'd like to sip the honey sweet from those red lips you see. I love, I love you, dearly, you dearly, dearly, and I want, want you, you to love, love me. You, you are my honey, honey honeysuckle. I am the bee. There we are, Mr. and Mrs. Hobbs. I'm happy to inform you that number 13 Roden Street is now at your disposal. Oh, uh, <laughs> you'd better take the front door key before I forget it. Oh, well, thanks very much, Mr. Cotton. Here we are. Yeah. Can't tell you how grateful we are to be moving into a house of our own for the first time. Yeah. Isn't that right, Letty? Letty? Pardon? Oh, yes. Yes, Mr. Cotton. We're very grateful indeed. Right. I'll oh, be off then. Oh, by the way, Mr. Hobbs, I usually make my rent calls on a Thursday each week. I hope that's convenient to you and the wife. Oh, yes, that'll be quite all right, yes. I'll say cheerio, then. Don't bother to see me out. Uh, believe it or not, I do know the way. Mark my words, Mr Hobbs. Number 13's going to be a lucky house for you. Yeah, well, uh, don't worry about the door handle. Just needs a couple of screws, that's all. Highway <laughs> bloody robber. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if he's going to be right, though. Now, what do you think, Letty? Will 13 really be our lucky number? Letty? <gasps> Letty? Letty, what, what, what is it? Look at it, Ollie. Out there. Our own scullery. <laughs> oh, my God. Is that all? <laughs> but it's so wonderful, Ollie. I mean, look at that lovely big stove copper. We can boil up all the hot water we want. On a Friday night, we can put the bathtub out here. <laughs> not unless we put up a curtain, we don't. I'm not going to be caught napping in my altogether. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lee, I never thought we could be so lucky. A house all to ourselves, with rooms on three different floors. It's like a dream. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm telling you now, we're going to have to have a lodger. I can't afford 15 bubble a week out of my wages, you know, even though I've got a decent job on the underground. Money's no problem. There's a school just a few doors away down the street. I'll get a part-time cleaning job. Ah, uh, no, no, you don't. Those days are past, Letty. From now on, there's only going to be one breadwinner in this family, me. You know something, Ollie? This house is going to be lucky for us. Do you really think so, Letty? Oh, yeah. I can feel it in my bones. As though... As though the walls are watching us. I can almost hear them saying, Don't worry, Letty. Don't worry, Oliver. You'll see. <laughs> Come on. Let's go and have a look at the attic. Hey, you think you can manage the stairs on your new leg? What do you mean, can I? I'll race you to the top. And look, Ollie... Isn't that St Paul's Cathedral over there? Do you see in the distance, just to the right of that white building? Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> just think of it, Ollie. Mr and Mrs Oliver J Hobbs, in residence at number 13 Roden Street. And with a view of the City of London from their own attic window. <sighs> oh, look, Ollie. Down there. Can you see our own back garden? Our junk heap, you mean? Don't you worry. I'll soon get that into shape. I might buy a few packets of poppy seeds from Woolworths. I like poppies. Blue eyes. Pardon? Bright blue. You told me that once before. It was a long time ago. Well, they look even more blue today. Sure sign you're feeling happy. Are you happy, Letty? Come here, Ollie. Now, closer. Why? I want to kiss you, that's why. Do you mind? Ollie, I'd 
like to have just one more child. What? No. <laughs> no, I don't mean right away, you fool. It was just that I was thinking how nice it would be to feel that this house was going to become part of us. Oh. We can't have any more kids, Letty. I've never heard such nonsense. Number 13's going to be our lucky number, isn't it? Oh, I hope so. Then let's make sure that it is. Let's give this old house a chance to prove itself. To provide the kind of home you and I have always wanted for us and our kids. You know, Ollie, when we first moved into that room of ours, I used to dream of having a place like this one day. Oh, not because I wasn't grateful for what I got, but... Because I wanted us to start something of our very own. To make something we could be proud of. It's funny, isn't it? A lot of people think they know so much about love. But I often wonder, I mean, it's not just a question of two people living together or sharing the same interests in life. It's the feeling that... that you're never really apart. No matter where you are, or what you're doing. I'll always be a part of you, Ollie. And you'll always be a part of me. Do you know why? Because we're a team, Ollie. You and I. We live out our lives for each other. And that's important. I love you, Ollie. I'll never stop loving you. You won't ever forget that, will you? <sighs> Look, golly. There's so much out there waiting for us to share together. I promise you, nothing will ever stand still for us again. We're going to be like one of those trains leaving the station. Moving on, on, on. We're on our way, Ollie. Our journey's just beginning. You and me together, it really is beginning. The trains don't stop here anymore. A love story based on real people and actual events was written by Victor Pemberton. In it, Nerys Hughes played the part of Letty and Nigel Anthony, that of Ollie. Wendy Richard was Violet, and Sheila Grant, Beatrice. William was played by Malcolm Hayes, Tom, Derek Seaton, Frank, Bill Monks, Nikki, Adam Godley, Bill, Kenneth Shanley, Amy Lyle, Eve Karp, Mr. Cotton, Eric Allen, and Pearson, Robert Trotter. The pianist was Mary Nash. The play was directed by John Tiderman. England, 1529. King Henry VIII is on the English throne. Cardinal Wolsey is Lord Chancellor, the most prestigious office in the land. Sir Thomas More is Speaker of the House of Commons one of the most intelligent and influential men in England, and, moreover, the King's friend. A man for all seasons. It is perverse to start a play made up of kings and cardinals in speaking costumes and intellectuals with embroidered mouths with me. If a king or a cardinal had done the prologue, he'd have had the right materials. And an intellectual would have shown enough majestic meanings, coloured propositions and closely woven liturgical stuff to dress the House of Lords. Well, I'll give you a proposition of my own. Now, uh... Where's my steward's costume? There's company to dinner. Duke of Norfolk and Master Richard Rich. Ah, oh, here we are. Matthew, the household steward of Sir Thomas More. A common man. A 16th century butler. The 16th century is the century of the common man. 
like all the other centuries. And that's my proposition. The wine, please, Matthew. It's there, Sir Thomas. Is it good? Bless you, sir. I don't know. Bless you too, Matthew. Every man has his price. Master Richard Rich. But yes, in money, too. No, no, no. All pleasure, titles, women, bricks and mortar, there's always something. Childish. Well, in suffering, certainly. By a man with suffering. Impose suffering and offer him escape. Oh, for the moment I thought you were being profound. Good evening, Matthew. Evening, sir. No, not a bit profound. It, it then becomes a purely practical question of how to make him suffer sufficiently. Mm. Richard, you should go back to Cambridge. You're deteriorating. Well, I'm not used. Do you know how much I have to show for seven months' work? Work? Work. Waiting's work when you wait as I wait hard. For seven months, that's 200 days, I have to show the acquaintance of the Cardinal's outer dormant, the indifference of the Cardinal's inner dormant, and the Cardinal's Chamberlain's hand in my chest. <laughs> oh, and also one half of a good morning delivered at 50 paces by the Duke of Norfolk. Doubtless he mistook me for someone. He was very affable at dinner. Oh, everyone's affable here. Also, of course, the, the friendship of Sir Thomas More. Or, should I say, acquaintance? Say friendship. Well, there. A friend of Sir Thomas and still no office? There must be something wrong with him. I thought we said friendship. The Dean of St. Paul's offers you a post with a house, a servant, and 50 pounds a year. What? What post? Uh, the new school. Oh, a teacher. Well, a man should go where he won't be tempted. Look, Richard, see this goblet? Look. Look. It's beautiful. Italian. Do you want it? Why, no joke. Keep it. Sell it. Well, uh, uh, thank you, of course. Uh, thank you, but It I... was sent to me a little while ago by some woman. Now she's put a lawsuit into the court of requests. It's a bribe, Richard. Oh. Huh. So you give it away, of course. Yes. Well, I'm not going to keep it. And you need it. But of course, if you feel it's um, contaminated... Uh, uh, no, 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 I'll risk it. <laughs> ah, why not be a teacher? You'd be a fine teacher, perhaps a great one. And if I was, who would know it? You, your pupils, your friends, God. Not a bad public that. Oh, in a quiet life. <laughs> you say that. Oh, Richard, I was commanded into office. It was inflicted on me. Can't you believe that? Hard. Be a teacher. I tell you, Alice, he scooped from the clouds. We'll settle it, my lord. We'll put it to Thomas. Thomas, no falcon could stoop from a cloud, could he? Well, I don't know, my dear. It sounds unlikely. There. Well, I've heard. Well, I've seen falcons do some very splendid things. But how could he stoop from a cloud? He couldn't see where he was going. You see, Alice, <laughs> you're ignorant of the subject. Oh, a real falcon don't care where he's going. That's sure <laughs> It was the very first cast of the day. The sun was behind us. And from side to side of the valley, like the roof of a tent, was solid mist. Oh, mist! Well, mist is cloud, isn't it? No. The opinion of Aristotle is that mists are an exhalation of the earth. Where he stood be... 500 feet. <laughs> like that. <laughs> like an act of God, isn't he, Thomas? He's tremendous. Tremendous. <laughs> what was that of Aristotle's, Richard? Uh, nothing, Sir Thomas. It was out of place. I've never found much use in Aristotle myself. Not practically. Great philosopher, of course. Wonderful mind. Exactly, Your Grace. Eh? Master Rich is newly converted to the doctrines of Machiavelli. Machiavelli. Oh, 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 the Italian no. nasty book from what I hear. The doctrines of Machiavelli have been largely mistaken, I think. Indeed, uh, properly apprehended, he has no doctrine. Uh, Master Cromwell has the sense of it, I think, when he says... You that... know Cromwell. Uh, Slightly, Your Grace. The Cardinal's secretary? No. What? It's a fact. When, Howard? Two, three days. A fact, son? Well, the Cardinal's a butcher's son, isn't he? It'll be up quick and down quick with Master Cromwell. Yeah. <laughs> Letter for you, Sir Thomas. Oh, thank you, Matthew. Talk of the Cardinal's secretary and the Cardinal appears. He wants me. Now. At this time of night? The king's business. The queen's business? More than likely, Alice, more than What's likely. What's the time? Eleven o'clock, sir. Is there a boat? Waiting, sir. Go to bed, my dear. Yes. You'll excuse me, Your Grace. Of course. Richard. Sir. Now, you go to bed. Dear Lord, 
Dear Lord. Give us rest tonight. Rest tonight. tonight. Or if we must be wakeful, cheerful. cheerful. Careful yeah, only for our soul's salvation. salvation. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. And bless our Lord the King. And bless our Lord the King. Amen. 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 Goodbye, my dear. Take care, Thomas. How are you at Richmond? No, down the river. Then good night. Uh, Sir Thomas, I wondered if... Oh, your grace. Um, Here's a young man desperate for employment. Something in the clerical line. Well, if you recommend him... No, I don't recommend him, but I point him out. He's at the new inn. You could take him there. All right. Come on. My Lord. Sir Thomas, thank you. Be a teacher, Richard. Your Grace, it's half past one. Where have you been? One o'clock, Your Grace. I've been on the river. Since you seem so violently opposed to the Latin dispatch, I thought you'd like to look it over. Oh, thank you, Your Grace. Before it goes... Your Grace is very kind. Thank you. Well, what do you think of it? It seems very well phrased, Your Grace. (laughs) The devil it does. And apart from the style, Sir Thomas... I think the Council should be told before that goes to Italy. Would you tell the Council? Yes, I believe you would. You're a constant regret to me, Thomas. If you could just see facts flat on, without that moral squint, (laughs) with just a little common sense, you could have been a statesman. Oh, your grace flatters me. Don't frivol. The king... Yes. He's been to play in the muck again. Indeed. Thomas, the king wants a son. What are you going to do about it? I'm very sure the king needs no advice from me on what to do about it. Thomas, we're alone. I give you my word. There is no one here. I didn't suppose there was, Your Grace. Oh. Do you favor a change of dynasty, Sir Thomas? Do you think two Tudors is sufficient? Then the king needs a son. I repeat, what are you going to do about it? I pray for it daily. God's death, he means it. That thing out there is at least fertile, Thomas. But she's not his wife. No. Catherine's his wife, and she's as barren as a brick. Are you going to pray for a miracle? There are our precedent. Yes. All right. Good. Pray. Pray by all means. But in addition to prayer, there is effort. My efforts to secure a divorce. Have I your support, or have I not? A dispensation was given so that the king might marry Queen Catherine for state reasons. Now we are to ask the Pope to dispense with his dispensation also for state reasons. I don't like plodding, Thomas. Don't make me plod longer than I have to. Well, then clearly all we have to do is approach His Holiness nicely. I think we might influence His Holiness's answer. With this dispatch? With that and in other ways. I've already expressed my opinion on that. Then good night. Oh, your conscience is your own affair. But you're a statesman. Do you remember the Yorkish Wars? Very clearly. Let him die without an heir and we'll have them back again. Let him die without an heir, and this peace you think so much of will go out like that. Very well, then. England needs an heir. Certain measures, perhaps regrettable, perhaps not. There is much in the church that needs reformation, Thomas. All right. Regrettable, but necessary to get us an heir. Now explain how you, as Councillor of England, can obstruct those measures for the sake of your own private conscience. Well, I believe when statesmen forsake their own private conscience for the sake of their public duties, they lead their country by a short route to chaos. And we shall have my prayers to fall back on. You'd like that, wouldn't you? To govern the country by prayer? Yes, I should. I'd like to be there when you try. Who will deal with all this paper? After me. You? Fisher, Suffolk. Fisher for me? Aye, but for the king. What about my secretary, Master Cromwell? Cromwell? 
You'd rather do it yourself? Me, rather than Crom. Then come down to Earth. And until then, allow for an enemy here. As your grace pleases. As God wills. Perhaps, your grace. More. You should have been a cleric. Like yourself, your grace. Allow me, Sir Thomas. Thank you. Is Lady Alice in bed? Yes, sir. Lady Margaret? No, sir. Master Roper's here. At this hour? Who let him in? He's a hard man to keep out, sir. Where are they? Uh, here, Father. Good morning, William. It's a little early for breakfast. I hadn't come for breakfast, sir. Will wants to marry me, Father. Well, he can't marry you. Sir Thomas, I'm to be called to the bar. Oh, congratulations, Roper. My family may not be at the palace, sir, but in the city they... Roper... Have... The answer's no, and will be no, so long as you're a heretic. That's a word I don't like, Sir Thomas. It's not a likable word. It's not a likable thing. The church is heretical. Dr. Luther's proved that to my satisfaction. Hmm? Luther's an excommunicate. From a heretic church. Church? It's a shop. Forgiveness by the Florin. Job lots now in Germany. Yes, and divorces. Divorces? Oh, oh. half England's buzzing with that. Half England. The ends of court may be buzzing. England doesn't buzz so easily. Listen, Roper. Two years ago, you were a passionate churchman. Now you're a passionate Lutheran. We must just pray that when your head's finished turning, your face is to the front again. And don't lengthen your prayers with me, sir. No. One more or less. Is your horse here? No, I walk. Well, take a horse from the stables and get back home. Go along. May I come again? Yes. Soon. Good night, sir. I'll see you around the Is that final, okay. Father? As long as he's a heretic, Meg, that's absolute. Nice boy. Terribly strong principles, though. Now it's somewhere here. Uh... Ah, yes. <clears throat> Whether we follow tradition in ascribing Woolsey's death to a broken heart, or accept Professor Larkham's less feeling diagnosis of pulmonary pneumonia, its effective cause was the king's displeasure. He died at Leicester on the 29th of November, 1530, while on his way to the Tower under charge of high treason. England's next Lord Chancellor was Sir Thomas More, a scholar and, by popular repute, a saint. His scholarship is supported by his writings. Saintliness is a quality less easy to establish but from his willful indifference to realities which were obvious to quite ordinary contemporaries, it seems all too probable that he had it. Rich, what brings you to Hampton? I came with the Duke last night, Master Cromwell. They're hunting again. It's a kingly pastime, Master Rich. <laughs> I'm glad you found employment. You're the Duke's uh, secretary, are you not? Uh, my work is is uh, mostly secretarial. Oh, is it his librarian you are? I do look after his grace's library, yes. Oh. Well, that's something. And I don't suppose you're bothered much by his grace in the library. <laughs> it's odd how differently men's fortunes flow. My late master died in disgrace, and here I am in the king's own service. There you are, in a comparative backwater. Yet the new Lord Chancellor is an old friend of yours. He isn't really my friend. Oh, I thought he was. In a sense, he is. Well, I always understood. He set you up in life. Master Cromwell, what is it that you do for the King? Yes, I should like to know that, Master Cromwell. Senior Chapuis. You've met His Excellency Rich, the Spanish Ambassador, the Duke of Norfolk's librarian. Uh, but how should we introduce you, Master Cromwell, if we had the happiness? Oh, sly. Do you notice how sly he is, Rich? Well, I suppose you would call me the king's ear. It's a useful organ, the ear. But, in fact, it's even simpler than that. When the king wants something done, I do it. For example, Master Cromwell? Oh. 
<laughs> Beware these professional diplomats. <laughs> well, now, for example, next week at Deptford, we are launching the Great Harry. A 1,000 tons, four masts, 66 guns, an overall length of 175 feet. It's expected to be very effective. All this you probably know. However, you may not know that the king himself will guide her down the river. Yes, yeah. the king himself will be her pilot. The king? He will have assistance, of course, but he himself will be her pilot. He will have a pilot's whistle upon which he will blow, and he will wear in every respect a common pilot's uniform, except for the material which will be cloth of gold. Uh, these innocent fancies require more preparation than you might suppose, and someone has to do it. Meanwhile, I do prepare myself for higher things. I stock my mind. Uh, Master Cromwell, don't we all? This ship, for instance, it has 56 guns, by the way, not 66, and only 40 of them heavy. After launching, I understand the king will take his barge to Chelsea. Yes. To uh, Sir Thomas Sir Thomas Moore's. Uh, will you be there? Oh, no, they'll talk about the divorce. The king will ask him for an answer. He has given his answer. The king will ask him for another. Sir Thomas is a good son of the church. Sir Thomas is a man. No sign of him, my lord. God's body, Alice, he must be found. He must be in the house. He's not in the house, mother. Then he must be here in the garden. He takes things too far, Alice. Do I not know it? It will end badly for I him. I know that too. My lady. Oh, where is my father? Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. My lady, the king. Yes. Yes, fool. And if the king arrives and the chancellor is not here. Uh, my lady, it's not my fault. Lady Alice, Thomas will get no good of it. This is not how wolves he made himself great. Thomas has his own way of doing things, my lord. Yes, yes, Thomas is unique. But where is Thomas? Thomas! Oh, oh, my lord Chancellor, what sort of fooling is this? Does the king visit you every day? No, but I go to Vespers most days. He's here. But isn't this visit meant to be a surprise? For you, yes, not for him. Father, oh, You propose to meet the king disguised in a cassock as a parish clerk? A parish clerk, my lord chancellor. You dishonor the king and his office. The service of God is not a dishonor to any office. Believe me, my friend, oh, I do not feel to be honor his majesty is doing. Oh, him 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 so you're oh, in the well, well, Your majesty does my house more honor than I fear my household can bear. No ceremony, Thomas, no ceremony. Ha, passing fancy. I happen to be on the river. Look, <laughs> mud. <laughs> I fear we come upon you unexpectedly, Lady Alice. Oh, no, Your Grace. Uh, that is, yes. But we are ready for you. Uh, ready to entertain Your Grace, that is. <laughs> the river's given me an appetite. Oh, if Your Grace would share a very simple supper. It would please me very much. This is my daughter Margaret, sir. She has not had the honor to meet your grace. Why, Margaret, they told me you were a scholar. Answer, Margaret. Among women, I pass for one, your grace. I'm something of a scholar, too, did you know? <laughs> All the world knows your grace's book, asserting the seven sacraments of the church. Ah, yes, between ourselves, your father had a hand in that. Hey, Thomas, here and there, your grace, in a minor capacity. <laughs> he seeks to shame me with his modesty. Look, we'll follow, Lady Alice. Thomas and I will follow. Yes, uh, okay. Wait, Margaret. Are you fond of music? Yes, your grace. Blow this whistle. Oh. No. Harder. <laughs> I brought them with me, Lady Alice. Take them in. Yes, your grace. Come, Meg. Listen to this, Thomas. Do you know it? No, your grace. Listen, I... listen, up. listen. Uh, yeah, be seated, Thomas. You are my friend, are you not? Your Majesty. And thank God I have a friend for my chancellor. 
<laughs> Readier to be friends, I trust, than he was to be Chancellor. My own knowledge of my poor ability. No, I will judge of your abilities, Thomas. Did you know that Woolsey named you for Chancellor? Woolsey? I, before he died, Woolsey named you, and Woolsey was no fool. He was a statesman of incomparable ability, Your Grace. Was he? Was he so? Then why did he fail me? Let be seated. It was villainy, then. Yes. Villainy. I was right to break him. He was all pride, Thomas. A proud man. Pride right through. And he failed me. He failed me in the one thing that mattered. The one thing that matters, Thomas, then or now. And why? He wanted to be Pope. Yes, he wanted to be the Bishop of Rome. I'll tell you something, Thomas, and you can check this for yourself. It was never merry in England while we had cardinals amongst us. I'm touching this matter of my divorce, Thomas. Have you thought of it since we last talked? Of little else. Then you see your way clear to me? That you should put away Queen Catherine, sire. Oh, alas, as I think of it. I see so clearly that I cannot come with your grace that my endeavour is not to think of it at all. Then you have not thought enough. Great God, Thomas, why do you hold out against me in the desire of my heart, the very wick of my heart? There is my right arm. Take your dagger and saw it from my shoulder and I will laugh and be thankful if by that means I can come with your grace with a clear conscience. Ah, oh, I know it, Thomas, I know. Your Majesty... I crave pardon if I offend. Speak, then. When I took the great seal, your majesty promised not to pursue me on this matter. Ah, so now I break my word, Mr. Moore. No, no, I'm joking. I joke roughly. <laughs> I often think I'm a rough fellow, yes. <laughs> a rough young fellow. <laughs> Be seated. Uh, that's, uh, Magnolia. Ah, yes. <laughs> We have one like it at Hampton. Not so red as this, though. <laughs> I'm in an excellent frame of mind. <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful. You must consider, Thomas, that I stand in peril of my soul. It was no marriage. She was my brother's widow. Leviticus, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. Leviticus, chapter 18, verse yes, 16. your grace, but Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is ambiguous. Your grace, I am not fit to meddle in these matters. For me, it seems a matter for the Holy See. Thomas, Thomas, does a man need a pope to tell him when he sins? It was a sin, Thomas. I admit it. I repent. And God has punished me. I have no son. Son after son, she's borne me, Thomas, all dead at birth or dead within the month. I never saw the hand of God so clear in anything. I have a daughter. She's a good child, a well-set child. But I have no son. If your majesty it is could... my bounden duty to put away the queen, and all the Pope Spectre and Peter shall not come between me and my duty. How is it that you cannot see? Everyone else does. Then why does your grace need my poor support? Because you are honest. But more to the purpose, you are known to be honest. There are those like Norfolk who follow me because I wear the crown. There are those like Master Cromwell who follow me because they are jackals with sharp teeth and I am their lion. And there is a mass that follows me because it follows anything that moves... And there is you. I am sick to think how much I must displease your grace. No, Thomas. I respect your sincerity. Respect? Oh, man, it's water in the desert. How did you like our music? That uh, air they played it had a certain... <laughs> Well, tell me what you thought of it. Could it have been your grace's own? <laughs> <laughs> Discovered! <laughs> now, I'll never know your true opinion. And that's irksome, Thomas, for we artists, though we love praise, yet we love truth better. Then I will tell your grace truly what I thought of it. 
Speak. To me, it seemed... Delightful. <laughs> Thomas, I chose the right man for Chancellor. And I must, in fairness, add that my taste in music is reputedly deplorable. No, 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 your taste in music is excellent. It exactly coincides with my own. <laughs> Touching this other business, Farky Thomas, I'll have no opposition. Your grace. No opposition, I say. No opposition. The conscience is your own affair, but you are my chancellor. There you have my word. I'll leave you out of it. But I don't take it kindly, Thomas. And I will have no opposition. I am your grace's loyal minister. If I cannot serve your grace in this great matter of the queen... Queen! I have no queen! Catherine is not my wife. No priest can make her so, and they that say that she is my wife are not only liars... The traitors. Mind it, Thomas. Am I a babbler, Your Grace? You are stubborn. Mm. If you could come with me, you are the man I would soonest raise. Yes, with my own hand. Oh, Your Grace overwhelmed me. Eight o'clock, Your Grace. Oh. Um. Lift yourself up, man. Have I not promised? Shall we eat? If your grace pleases. What will your grace sing for us? Eight o'clock, you said. Thomas, the tide will be changing. I was forgetting the tide. I'd better go. I'm sorry, your grace. I must catch the tide or I'll not get back to Richmond till the... No, don't come. Tell Norfolk. Oh, oh well, Lady Alice, I must go. It. I want to catch the tide. Oh. Of the truth, Lady Alice, I have forgotten. In your haven here, a time flows past outside. Affairs call me to court, and so I give him my thanks and say, uh, good night. Good night, Your Grace. Good night, Your Grace. What's this? You crossed him. Somewhat. Why? I couldn't find the other way. You're too nice altogether, Thomas. Woman, mind your house. I am minding my house. But, Alice, what would you want me to do? Be ruled. If you won't rule him, be ruled. I neither could nor would rule my king. But there's a little... little area where I must rule myself. It's very little. Less to him than a tennis court. Oh. Look, Alice, it was eight o'clock. and eight o'clock, Lady Anne likes to dance. Oh. I think so. And you stand between them. I? What stands between them is a sacrament of the church. I'm less important than you think, Alice. Thomas, Thomas, stay friends with him. Whatever can be done by smiling, you may rely on me to do. Oh, you don't know how to flatter. I flatter very well. My recipe is beginning to be widely copied. It's the basic syrup with just a soup son of discreet impudence. I wish he'd eaten here. Mm. We shall be living on that simple supper of yours for a fortnight. Alice. Alice. Set your mind at rest. Your husband is not the stuff of which martyrs are made. Sir Thomas. Oh, no. Will, Roper, what do you want? William, I told you not to. I'm not easily told, Maggie. I asked you not to. Sir, I wish to speak to you. My spirit is perturbed. Yes, it will. Why? I... I've been offered a seat in the next Parliament. Oh, yes, will. Ought I to take it? No. Well, that depends. With your views on church reformation, I should have thought you could do yourself a lot of good in the next Parliament. My views on the church, I must confess. Since we met, my views have somewhat modified. Uh -huh. I modify nothing concerning the body of the church. The money changers in the temple must be scourged from thence, with a scourge of fire, if that is needed. But an attack on the church itself? No. I see behind that an attack on God. Roper. The devil's work will be done by the devil's but ministers. For heaven's sake, would you remember my office? Ah. If you stand on your office... I don't stand on it, but there are certain things I may not hear. Sophistication. It's what I was told. The court has corrupted you, Sir Thomas. You're not the man you were. You have learned to study your convenience. You have learned to flatter. The Alice, you see, I have a reputation for it. God's body, young man. If I was a chancellor, I'd have you whipped. Master Richard here, Sir Thomas. Oh, no. Good evening, sir. 
Richard? Good evening, Lady Alice. Good evening. Lady Margaret. Good evening, Master Rick. Do you know William Roper, the younger? By reputation, of course. Well, good evening, Master. Rich. Oh. Oh. You have heard of me? Yes. In what connection? I, I, I don't know what you can have heard. I sense that I'm not welcome here. Why, Richard, have you done something that should make you not welcome? Why, do you suspect me of it? I shall begin to. Cromwell is asking questions. He's continually collecting information about you. I know it. Stay a minute, Matthew. Uh, uh, yes, sir. He's one of his sources. Of course, he's one of my servants. Senior Chapwees, the Imperial Ambassador, collects information, too. That's one of his functions. You look at me as though I were an enemy. Why, Richard, you're shaking. I'm adrift. Help me. How? Employ me. No. Employ me. No. I would be steadfast. Richard, you couldn't answer for yourself, even so far as tonight. Good evening, Sir Thomas. Arrest him. Yes. Well, what? He's dangerous. He's a libel. He's a spy. He's arrest him. Oh, that man's bad. There is no law against that. There is God's law. Then God can arrest him. Oh, sophistication upon sophistication. No, sheer simplicity. The law, Roper, the law. I know what's legal, not what's right. And I'll stick to what's legal. Then you set man's law above God. No, far below. But let me draw your attention to a fact. I am not God. The currents and eddies of right and wrong, which you find such plain sailing, I can't navigate. I'm no voyager. But in the thickets of the law... Oh, there. I'm a forester. I doubt if there's a man alive who could follow me there, thank God. Why you talk? He's gone. And go. He should if he was the devil himself until he broke the law. So now you'd give the devil benefit of law. Yes. What would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws all being flat? This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. I have long suspected this. This is the golden calf. The law's your god. Oh. God's my God. But I find him rather too subtle. I don't know where he is nor what he wants. Yes. Hmm. It may be that I am a little intoxicated, Rich, but not with alcohol. With success. And who has a strong head for success? None of us gets enough of it, except kings, and they're born drunk. Success? What success? Yes. Collector of revenues for York? You do keep your ear to the ground, don't you, Rich? No, better than that. A high constable? Better than that. Better than high constable? Much better. Sir Thomas Paget is um, retiring. Secretary to the council. It is astonishing, isn't it? Uh, um, no. Master Cromwell, I mean, uh, one sees it. It's uh, logical. No ceremony, no courtship. Be seated. As His Majesty would say. <laughs> yes. See how I trust you. Oh, I, I would never repeat or report a, a thing like that. What kind of thing would you... Repeat or report? Well, uh, nothing said in friendship. Uh, may I say friendship? If you like. Uh, do you believe that, that you would never repeat or report anything, etc., etc.? Oh, yes. No, but seriously. Uh, yes. Rich. Seriously. It would depend on what I was offered. Everyone knows it. Not many people can say it. Well, congratulations. On what? I think you'd make a good collector of revenues for York Diocese. What do I have to do for it? Nothing. 
It isn't like that, Rich. There are no rules. With rewards and penalties, so much wickedness purchases so much worldly prospering. Are you sure you're not religious? Almost sure. Get sure. No, it's not like that. It's much more a matter of um, convenience, administrative convenience. Uh, the normal aim of administration is to keep steady this factor of convenience, and Sir Thomas would agree. Now, normally, when a man wants to change his woman, you let him if it's convenient and prevent him if it's not. Now, normally, indeed, it's of so little importance that you leave it to the priests, but the constant factor is this element of convenience. Who's convenient? Oh, ours. But everybody's, too. However, in the present instance, the man who wants to change his woman is our sovereign lord, Harry, by the grace of God, the eighth of that name, which is a quaint way of saying that if he wants to change his woman, he will. So, that becomes the constant factor. And our job as administrators is to make it as convenient as we can. I say our job on the assumption you'll take this post at York I've offered you. Yes, yes, yes. It's a bad sign when people are depressed by their own good fortune. Oh, no, I'm not depressed. You look depressed. <laughs> I'm lamenting. I've lost my innocence. You lost that some time ago, if you've only just noticed. It can't have been very important to you. That's true. Oh, my, that's true, it can't. We experience a sense of relief, do we, Master Rich? An unfamiliar freshness in the head as of open air? Collector revenues isn't bad. Not bad for a start. Now, our present Lord Chancellor, there's an innocent man. The odd thing is, he is. Yes, I say, he is. Tell me, Rich, this goblet that he gave you, how much was it worth? Come along. Rich, he gave you a silver goblet. How much did you get for it? Fifty shillings. Could you take me to the shop? Yes. Where did he get it? It was a gift from a litigant. A woman, wasn't it? Yes. Which court? Chancery? Court of request. That, that wasn't too painful, was it? <laughs> no. Well, that's all there is, and you'll find it easier next time. What application do they have, these tidbits of information you collect? None at all, usually. But sometimes... Well, there are these men, you know, upright, steadfast men who want themselves to be the constant factor in the situation, which, of course, they can't be. The situation rolls forward in any case. So what happens? If they have any sense, they get out of the way. What if they haven't any sense? What, none at all? Well, then, they're only fit for heaven. But Sir Thomas has plenty of sense. He could be frightened. Don't forget he's an innocent, Master Cromwell. I think we'll finish there for tonight. After all, he is the Lord Chancellor. You wouldn't find him easy to frighten. You've mistaken your man this time. He doesn't know how to be frightened. Doesn't know how to be frightened? Why, then, he never put his hand in a candle, did he? Oh! You enjoyed that. You enjoyed it! Two years have passed. It's now the middle of May, 1532. Well, during that time, a lot of water has flowed under the bridge. And among the things that have come floating along it is... Ah, oh, here we are. The Church of England, that finest flower of our island genius for compromise. That system, peculiar to these shores, which deflects the torrents of religious passion down the canals of moderation... That's very well put. <laughs> Typically, this great effect was achieved not by bloodshed, but by simple act of Parliament. Only an unhappy few were found to set themselves against the current of their times, and in so doing, to court disaster. For we are dealing with an age less fastidious than our own. Imprisonment without trial, and even examination under torture, were common practice then.
Must you wear those clothes, Will? Yes, I must. Why? The time has come for decent men to declare their allegiance. Of what allegiance are those designs to express? My allegiance to the church. Well, you look like a Spaniard. All credit to Spain, then. You wouldn't last six months in Spain. You'd have been burned alive in Spain during your heretic period. I suppose you have the right to remind me of it. That chain of office that you wear is a degradation. I told you, if the bishops in convocation submitted this morning, I'll take it off. It's no degradation. Great men have worn this. When do you expect to hear from Canterbury? About now. The Archbishop promised me an immediate message. I don't see what difference convocation can make. The church is already a wing of the palace, is it not? The king is already its supreme head, is he not? No. You deny the act of supremacy. No, I'm not. The act states that the king is supreme head of the church in England. Supreme head of the church in England, so far as the law of God allows. How far the law of God does allow it remains a matter of opinion, since the act doesn't state it. A legal quibble. Call it what you like. It's there, thank God. Very well. In your opinion, how far does the law of God allow this? I'll keep my opinion to myself, Will. Yes? Well, I'll tell you mine. Don't. It's... If your opinion's what I think it is, it's high treason, Roper. Will, you remember you've a wife now, and may have children. Why must you remember that? To keep myself discreet. Then I'd rather you forgot it. <laughs> you are either idiots or children. All saints, my lord. Our father, Signor Chapuis, has come to see you. Your Excellency. Or saints, my lord. Or saints. That's it, of course. Saints. Roper. Turn your head a bit. Hmm? Yes, I think I do detect a faint radiance. <laughs> you should have told us, Will. Oh. Come, come, my lord. You too at this time are not free from some suspicion of saintliness. I don't like the sound of that, Your Excellency. William. Margaret. The Imperial Ambassador is here on business. Would you mind? Oh, of course. Sir. What do you want? Rumour has it that if the church in convocation has submitted to the king, you will resign. I see. Supposing the rumour to be right, would you approve of that? Approve? Applaud? Admire? Uh, why? Because it would show one man, and that man known to be temperate, unable to go further with this wickedness. And that man known to be Chancellor of England, too? Believe me, my lord... Such a signal would be seen... Signal? Uh, yes, my lord. It would be seen and understood. By whom? By half your fellow countrymen. Really? Sir Thomas, I have just returned from Yorkshire and Northumberland, where I have made a tour. Have you, indeed? Things are very different there, my lord. There they are ready. For what? Resistance. Sir Thomas, excuse me, sir. His Grace, the Duke of Norfolk. It's all over, sir. They've decided to... One moment, Roper. I'll do this. Thomas. Oh. I was on the point of leaving, Your Grace. Uh, just a personal call. I have been trying uh, uh, to borrow a book, but without success. Uh, you're sure you have no copy, my lord? Uh, then I'll leave you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, ladies, goodbye, Eric. Sir Thomas. I'll do it, Roper. Convocation's knuckled under, Thomas. You have to pay a fine of a hundred thousand pounds. And, uh, we've severed the connection with Rome. The connection with Rome is nice. The connection with Rome. Did anyone resist? Uh, Bishop Fisher. Lovely man. Your Grace, this is quite certain, is it? Yes. Yeah. Funny company, Thomas. It's quite unintentional. He doesn't mean to be funny. Help me with this chain. Not I. So I, sir. No, thank you, Will. Alice? Help, fire. God's blood and body, no! Son of no master more, you're taken for a wise man. Is this wisdom? To betray your ability, abandon practice, forget your station and, and, and your duty to your kin? And behave like a printed book? Margaret, will you? If you want. There's my clever girl. Well, Thomas, why? Make me understand. Because I'll tell you now, from where I stand, this looks like cowardice. All right, I will. This isn't reformation. This is war against the church. Our king, Norfolk, has declared war on the Pope because the Pope will not declare that our queen is not his wife. And is she? I'll answer that question for one person only, the king. I am that in private, too. Man, you're cautious. Yes, cautious. I'm not one of your hawks. 
Have I your word that what we say here is between us and has no existence beyond these walls? Very well. And if the king should command you to repeat what I have said? I should keep my word to you. Then what has become of your oath of obedience to the king? You lay traps for me. No. I show you the times. Why do you insult me with these lawyer's tricks? Because I am afraid. And here's your answer. The king accepts your resignation very sadly. He is mindful of your goodness and past loyalty, and in any matter concerning your honor and welfare, he will be your good lord. So much for your fear. You will convey my humble thanks to the king. I will. Good day, Alice. Goodbye, my lord. I'd rather deal with you than with your husband. So there's an end of you. What will you do now? Sit by the fire and make goslings in the ash? Not at all, Alice. I expect I'll write a bit. I'll write, I'll read, I'll think. I think I'll learn to fish. I'll play with my grandchildren when some rope has done his duty. Alice, shall I teach you to read? No, by God. Some rope, are you pleased with me, I hope? Sir, you've made a noble gesture. A gesture? Hmm. It was impossible to continue, Will. I was not able to continue. I would have if I could. I make no gesture. By God, I hope it's understood. I make no gesture. Poor silly man. Do you think they'll leave you here to learn to fish? If we govern our tongues, they will. Look, I have a word to say about that. I have made no statement. I've resigned, that's all. On the king's supremacy, the king's divorce, which he'll now grant himself, the marriage he'll then make, have you heard me make a statement? No. And if I'm to lose my rank and fall to housekeeping, I want to know the reason. So make a statement now. No. Alice, it's a point of law. Thomas. Accept it from me, Alice, but in silence is my safety under the law. But my silence must be absolute. It must extend to you. In short, you don't trust us. Look, I'm the Lord Chief Justice. I'm Cromwell. I'm the King's head jailer. And I take your hand and I clamp it on the Bible, on the Blessed Cross. And <sighs> I say, woman... Has your husband made a statement on these matters? Now, on peril of your soul, remember, what's your answer? No. And so it must remain. Don't. Oh, it's only a lifeline. We shan't have to use it, but it's comforting to have. No. no, no. When they find I'm silent, they'll ask nothing better than to leave me silent. <laughs> You'll see. But he makes no noise, Cromwell. He's silent. Why not leave him silent? Not being a man of letters, Your Grace, you perhaps don't realize the extent of his reputation. This silence of his is bellowing up and down Europe. But and I... Now, may I recapitulate? He reported the ambassador's conversation to you, informed on the ambassador's tour of the North Country, warned against a possible rebellion there. He did. Uh, we may say, then, that he showed himself hostile to the hopes of Spain. That's what I say. Bear with me, Your Grace. Now, if he opposes Spain, he supports us. And with a little pressure, he can be got to say so. And that's all we need, a brief declaration of his loyalty to the present administration. I still say let sleeping dogs lie. The king does not agree with you. What? What? What kind of pressure do you think you can bring to bear? I have evidence that Sir Thomas, during the period of his judicature, accepted bribes. What? God damn it, he was the only judge since Cato who didn't accept bribes. When was there last a chancellor whose possessions after three years in office totaled 100 pounds and a gold chain? Sir Richard, it is, as you imply, a common practice, but a practice may be common and remain an offence. This offence could send a man to the tower. I don't believe it. Ah, uh, Richard, you know his grace, the Duke of Norfolk. Indeed, yes, we're, we're old friends. You used to look after my books or something, didn't you? Uh, come here. Uh, this woman's name is Catherine Anger. She comes from Lincoln, and she put a case in the court of requests in... A property case, it was. Be quiet. A property case in the Court of Requests in April 1526. And got a wicked false judgment. And got an impeccably correct judgment from our friend Sir Thomas. No, sir, it was not. We are not concerned with the judgment, but with the gift you gave the judge. Tell this gentleman about that. that the judgment, for what it's worth, was the right one. No, sir. 
I sent him a cup, sir. An Italian silver cup I bought in Lincoln for a hundred shillings. Did Sir Thomas accept this cup? I sent it. He did accept it. We can corroborate that. You can go. Look. Go. Is that your witness? No. By an odd coincidence, this cup later came into the hands of Master Rich here. How? He gave it to me. Can you corroborate that? I have a fellow outside who can. He was more steward at that time. Shall I call him? Oh, don't bother. I know him. When did Thomas give you this thing, Rich? I don't exactly remember. Well, make an effort. My uh, wait. I can tell you. I can tell you it was that spring. It was that night we were there together. You had a cup with you when we left. Was that it? It may have been. Did he often give you cups? I don't suppose so, Your Grace. Well, that was it, then. And it was April. The April of 26th. The very month that cow first put a case before him. In other words, the moment he knew it was a bribe, he got rid of it. The facts will bear that interpretation, I suppose. Oh, this is a horse that won't run, Master Secretary. Just a trial canter, Your Grace. We'll find something better. Look here, Cromwell. I, I want no part of this. You have no choice. What's that you say? The King particularly wishes you to be active in the matter. He's not told me that. Indeed. He told me. But why? We feel that since you are known to have been a friend of Moore's, your participation will show that there is nothing in the nature of a um, persecution, but only the strict processes of law, as indeed you've just demonstrated. But I'll tell the king of your loyalty to your friend. If you like, I'll tell him that you want no part of it, too. Are you threatening me, Cromwell? My dear Norfolk, this isn't Spain. Is this another personal visit, Shapwees, or is it official? It falls between the two, Sir Thomas. Official, then? No. I have a personal letter for you. From whom? From King Charles. Uh, you will take it? I will not lay a finger on it. It is in no way an affair of state. It expresses my master's admiration for the stand which you and Bishop Fisher of Rochester have taken over the so-called divorce of Queen Catherine. I have taken no stand. But your views, Sir Thomas, are well known. My views are much guessed at. May I? Alice! Alice! Thomas? This is a letter from King Charles. I want you to see it's not been opened. I have declined it. You see, the seal has not been broken. I do, Thomas. I wish I could ask you to stay, Your Excellency. The bracken fire is a luxury. One I must forego. May I say I'm sure my master's admiration will not be diminished? I am gratified. Your Excellency. <laughs> luxury. Well, it's a luxury while it lasts. <laughs> There's not much sport in it for you, is there? Alice, the money from the bishops... I wish, oh, heaven, how I wish I could take it, but I can't. I didn't think you would. Alice, there are reasons. We couldn't come so deep into your confidence as to know these reasons why a man in poverty can't take four thousand pounds. Alice, this isn't poverty. Do you know what we shall eat tonight? Yes, parsnips. Yes, parsnips and stinking mutton for a night's lady. But at the worst, we could be beggars and still keep company and be merry together. Merry? By merry. Oh, don't you see, if I'm paid by the church for my writings... This had nothing to do with your writings. This was charity, pure and simple, collected from the clergy, high and low. It would appear as payment. You're not a man who deals in appearances. Oh, am I not, though? If the king takes this matter any further with me or with the church, it will be very bad if I even appear to have been in the pay of the church. Bad? If you will have it, dangerous. But you don't write against the king. I write... And that's enough in times like these. You said there was no danger. I don't think there is. And I don't want there to be. There's a gentleman here from Hampton Court. You're to go before Secretary Cromwell to answer certain charges. Charges? Well, that's all right. We expected that. When? Now. Oh. That means nothing, Alice. That's just technique. Well... 
I suppose now means now. I'm sorry to invite you here at such short notice, Sir Thomas. Good of you to come. Uh, will you take a seat? Thank you. I think you know Master Rich. Indeed, yes, we're old friends. That's a nice gown you have, Richard. Master Rich will make a record of our conversation. Good of you to tell me, Master Secretary. <laughs> Believe me, Sir Thomas. No, that's asking too much. But let me tell you all the same, you have no more sincere admirer than myself. <laughs> no need to write yet, Rich. <laughs> if I might hear the charges. Charges? I understand there are certain charges. Some ambiguities of behaviour I should like to clarify. Hardly charge it. Make a note of that, will you, Master Rich? There are no charges. <laughs> Sir Thomas, Sir Thomas. You know, it amazes me that you, who were once so effective in the world and are now so much retired from it, should be opposing yourself to the whole movement of the time. It amazes me, too. The King is not pleased with you. I am grieved. Yet, do you know that even now, if you could bring yourself to agree with the universities, the bishops, and the parliament of this realm, there is no honour which the king would be likely to deny you? I am well acquainted with his grace's generosity. Very well. Sir Thomas, <laughs> Rich, uh, Sir Thomas, in the May of 1521, the king published a book, a theological work. It was called A Defence of the Seven Sacraments. Yes for which he was named Defender of the Faith by His Holiness the Pope. By the Bishop of Rome, or do you insist on Pope? No, Bishop of Rome, if you like. It doesn't alter his authority. Thank you. You come to the point very readily. What is that authority? As regards the Church in other parts of Europe, for example, the Church of England, what exactly is the Bishop of Rome's authority? You will find it very ably set out and defended, Master Secretary, in the King's book. The book published under the King's name would be more accurate. You wrote that book. I wrote no part of it. Yeah, I do not mean you actually held the pen. I merely answered, to the best of my ability, certain questions on canon law which His Majesty put to me, as I was bound to do. Do you deny that you instigated it? It was from first to last the King's own project. This is trivial, Master Cromwell. I should not think so if I were in your place. Only two people know the truth of the matter. Myself and the king. And whatever he may have said to you, he will not give evidence to support this accusation. Why not? Because evidence is given on oath and he will not perjure himself. If you don't know that, you don't yet know him. Sir Thomas More, is there anything you wish to say to me concerning the king's marriage with Queen Anne? I understood I was not to be asked that again. Evidently you understood wrongly. These charges are... Our terrors for children, Mr. Secretary, not for me. Then know that the king commands me to charge you in his name with great ingratitude and to tell you that there never was nor never could be so villainous a servant nor so traitorous a subject as yourself. So I am brought here at last. Brought? You brought yourself to where you stand now? Yes. Still in another sense. I was brought. So? Yes. You may go home now, for the present. Thank you, Master Cromwell. Richard. I don't like him so well as I did, Richard. There's a man who raises the gale and won't come out of harbour. Father! Father! Do you know, sir? Have you heard? We've been looking for you, Father. There should be a new act through Parliament, sir. Act? Yes, sir, about the marriage. Oh. Father, by this act, they're going to administer an oath. An oath? On what compulsion? It's expected to be treason. What is the oath? <laughs> it's about the marriage, sir. What is the wording? <laughs> we don't need to know the wording. We know what it will mean. It will mean what the words say. An oath is made of words. It may be possible to take it or avoid it. Have we a copy of the bill? There's one coming out from the city. Then let's get home and look at it. But, sir... Now listen, Will, and Meg, you listen too. God made the angels to show him splendor, as he made the animals for innocence and plants for their simplicity. But man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. If he suffers us to fall to such a case that there is no escaping, then we may stand to our tackle as best we can. But, sir... And yes, Will, then we may clamour like champions if we have the spittle for it. 
And no doubt it delights God to see splendor where he only looked for complexity. But it's God's part, not our own, to bring ourselves to that extremity. Our natural business lies in escaping. So let's get home and study this bill. Now look, I don't suppose anyone enjoyed putting him in prison any more than he enjoys being there. Well, not much more. Jailer, it's a job. The pay scale being what it is, you have to take a rather common top of man into the prison service. But it's a job like any other job. A bit nearer the knuckle than most, perhaps. What, again? Sorry, sir. Oh, what time is it? Just struck one, sir. This is iniquitous. Sir. All right. Who's there? The secretary, the Duke of Norfolk, and Archbishop Cranmer. I'm flattered. Lead me to them. Sir Thomas, you have seen this document before? Many times. It is the act of succession. These are the names of those who have sworn to it. I have, as you say, seen it before. Will you swear to it? No. Thomas, we must know plainly whether you recognize the offspring of Queen Anne as heirs to his majesty. The king in Parliament tells me that they are. Of course I recognize them. Will you swear that you do? Yes. Then why won't you swear to the act? Because there is more than that in the act. Is that it? Yes. Then we must find out what it is in the act that he objects to. Brilliant. Your Grace... May I try? Certainly, Archbishop. I have no pretensions to be an expert in police work. <coughs> Sir Thomas, it states in the preamble that the king's former marriage to the Lady Catherine was unlawful, she being previously his brother's wife, and the uh, Pope having no authority to sanction it. Is uh, that what you deny? Is that what you dispute? Is that what you are not sure of? Thomas, you insult the king and his council in the person of the Lord Archbishop. I insult no one. I will not take the oath. I will not tell you why I will not. Then your reason must be treasonable. Not must be. Maybe. It's a fair assumption. The law requires more than an assumption. The law requires a fact. Is it material why you won't swear? It's most material. For refusing to swear, my goods are forfeit and I am condemned to life imprisonment. You cannot lawfully harm me further. But if you were right in supposing I had reasons for refusing, and right again in supposing my reasons to be treasonable, the law would let you cut my head off. Oh, yes. Oh, well done, Sir Thomas. I've been trying to make that clear to his grace for some time. Oh, confound all this. I'm not a scholar, as Master Cromwell never tires of pointing out. And frankly, I don't know whether the marriage was lawful or not, but damn it, Thomas, look at those names. You know those men. Can't you do what I did and come with us for fellowship? And when we stand before God, and you are sent to paradise for doing according to your conscience, and I am damned for not doing according to mine... Will you come with me for fellowship? So those of us whose names are there are damned, Sir Thomas? I don't know, Your Grace. I have no window to look into another man's conscience. Uh, Sir Thomas, you don't seem to appreciate the seriousness of your position. I defy anyone to live in that cell for a year and not appreciate the seriousness of his position. Uh, yet the state has harsher punishment. You threaten like a dockside bully. How should I threaten? Like a minister of state. With justice. Oh, justice is what you're threatened with. Then I'm not threatened. Master Secretary, I think the prisoner may retire. Unless you, my lord... No, 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 I see no purpose in prolonging the interview. Then, good night, Thomas. <sighs> Might I have one or two more books? You have books? Yes. I didn't know. You shouldn't have. May I see my family? No. Jailer? Sir? Have you ever heard the prisoner speak of the king's divorce or the king's supremacy of the church or the king's marriage? No, sir. Not a word. 
If he does, you will, of course, report it to the lieutenant. Of course, sir. You will swear an oath to that effect? Certainly, sir. Archbishop, uh, <coughs> place your left hand on this and raise your right hand. Uh, take your hat off. <laughs> now, say after me. I swear by my mortal soul. I swear by my mortal soul. That I will report truly anything said by Sir Thomas More. That I will report truly anything said by Sir Thomas More. Against the king, the council, or the state of the realm. Against the king, the council, or the state of the realm. So help me God. Amen. Amen. And there's 50 guineas in it if you do. Yes, sir. Uh, That's not to tempt you into perjury, my man. No, sir. 50 guineas isn't tempting. 50 guineas is alarming. If he left it at swearing... But fifty, that's serious money. If it's worth that much now, it's worth my neck presently. I want no part of it. They can sort it out between them. I feel my deafness coming on. Wake up, Sir Thomas. What? Your family's here. Oh, oh, what? Sir Thomas. My, 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 you can visit me. Mac! Alice! Roper! For God's sake, they've not put you in here. No, uh, just a visit. A short one. James, James, let them in. Can you do that? Yes, sir. I'm allowed to. Do that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. Father. Oh, oh, good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, good morning, Will. Husband, ah. how do you do? As well as need be, Alice. Very happy now. It's an awful place. Oh, except it's keeping me from you, my dear. It's not so bad. Remarkably like any other place. Yes. Too near the river. We brought you some things. Hmm? Some cheese. Cheese. And custard. And custard. And these other things. And a bottle of wine. Oh, is it good, son, Roper? I don't know, sir. Ah. Well? Sir, come out. Swear to the act. Take the oath and come out. Is this why they let you come? Yes. Meg's under oath to persuade you. That was silly, Meg. How did you come to do that? I wanted to. When a man takes an oath, Meg, he's holding his own self in his hands, like water. And if he opens his fingers then, he needn't hope to find himself again. Some men aren't capable of this, but I'd be loath to think your father one of them. So should I. Then... There's something else I've been thinking. Oh, Meg. In any state that was half good, you would be raised up high. Not here, for what you've done already. All right. It's not your fault the state's three quarters bad. No. Then, if you elect to suffer for it, you elect yourself a hero. That is very neat. But look now. If we lived in a state where virtue was profitable, common sense would make us good and greed would make us saintly... And we'd live like animals or angels in the happy land that needs no heroes. So that means but that... since, in fact, we see that avarice, anger, envy, pride, sloth, lust and stupidity commonly profit far beyond humility, chastity, fortitude, justice and thought and have to choose to be human at all, why then perhaps we must stand fast a little, even at the risk of being heroes. But in reason... Haven't you done as much as God can reasonably want? Well, finally, it isn't a matter of reason. Finally, it's a matter of love. You're content, then, to be shut up here with mice and rats when you might be home with us? Content? If they'd open the smallest crack, I'd be through it. Two minutes to go, sir. No. Don't you like to know? Two no. minutes. Till seven o'clock, sir. Sorry. No. Uh, two minutes. Now, listen. You must leave the country. All of you must leave the country. I leave you here. It makes no difference, Meg. They won't let you see me again. You must all go on the same day, but not on the same boat. Different boats from different ports. So after the trial, then? There'll be no trial. They have no case. Do this for me, I beseech you. Yes. Alice? Alice, I command it. Right. Alice, if you can tell me that you understand, I think I can make a good death if I have to. Your death's no good to me. Alice, you must tell me that you understand. I don't. I don't believe this had to happen. If you say that, Alice, I don't see how I'm to face it. It's the truth. You're an honest woman. Much good may it do me. I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. That when you're gone, I shall hate you for it. Well, you mustn't, Alice. That's all. You mustn't. You... For understanding, I understand.
find you the best man I've ever met, or I'm likely to. And if you go... Well, God knows what I suppose. I was gone to my witness. God's kept deadly quiet about it. And if anyone wants my opinion of the king and his council, they've only to ask for it. Sorry, sir. Time's out. Oh, 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 Goodbye. You're doing your husband no good. You understand my position, sir? There's nothing I can do. I'm a plain and simple man and just want to keep out of trouble. Oh, sweet Jesus! These plain, simple men! Sir Thomas More, you were called before us here at the Hall of Westminster to answer charge of high treason. Nevertheless, and though you have heinously offended the King's Majesty, we hope, if you will even now forthink and repent of your obstinate opinions, you may still taste his gracious pardon. My Lord, I thank you. Howbeit, I make my petition to Almighty God that he will keep me in this, my honest mind, to the last hour that I shall live. As for the matters you may charge me with, I fear from my present weakness that neither my wit nor my memory will serve to make sufficient answers. I should be glad to sit down. Be seated. <laughs> Master Secretary Cromwell, have you the charge? I have, my lord. Then read the charge. It is the same charge, Sir Thomas, that was brought against Bishop Fisher. The late Bishop Fisher, I should have said. Late? Bishop Fisher was executed this morning. Master ah. Secretary, read the charge. That you did conspire, traitorously and maliciously, to deny and deprive our liege Lord Henry of his undoubted certain title, Supreme Head of the Church in England. I have never denied this title. You refused the oath tendered you at the time. Silence of the is not denial. And for my silence I am punished with imprisonment. Why have I been called again? On a charge of high treason, Sir Thomas. For which the punishment is not imprisoned. Death comes for all of us, my lords. Yes, even for kings he comes. To whom amidst all their royalty and brute strength he will neither kneel nor make them any reverence, nor pleasantly desire them to come forth but roughly grasp them by the very breast and rattle them until they be stark dead, so causing their bodies to be buried in a pit and sending them to a judgment, whereof at their death their success is uncertain. Treason enough here. The death of kings is not in question, Sir Thomas. Nor mine, I trust, until I'm proven guilty. Your life lies in your own hands, Thomas, as it always has. For our own death. My lord, yours and mine, dare we for shame desire to enter the kingdom with ease when our lord himself entered with so much pain? Now, Sir Thomas, you stand upon your silence. I do. A silence betokening the most eloquent of denial. Qui tacit consentiri. The maxim of the law is, silence gives consent. If, therefore, you wish to construe what my silence betokened, you must construe that I consented, not that I denied. Is that what the world, in fact, construes from it? Do you pretend that is what you wish the world to construe from it? The world must construe according to its wits. This court must construe according to the law. I put it to the court that the prisoner is perverting the law, making smoky what should be a clear light to discover to the court his own wrongdoing. The law is not a light for you or any man to see by. The law is not an instrument of any kind. The law is a causeway upon which, so long as he keeps to it, a citizen may walk safely. 
in matters of conscience. The conscience! The conscience! The word is not familiar oh, to you. My God, too familiar. I am very used to hear it in the mouths of criminals. I am used to hear bad men misuse the word of God, yet God exists. In matters of conscience, the loyal subject is more bounden to be loyal to his conscience than to any other thing. And so provide a noble motive for his frivolous self-conceit. Uh, my lord, I wish to call Sir Richard Rich. Sir Richard? I do solemnly swear... I do solemnly swear that the evidence I shall give before the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, so help me God, Sir Richard. So help me God. Take your stand there, Sir Richard. Now, Rich, on 12th of March, you were at the tower. I was. With what purpose? I was sent to carry away the prisoner's books. Did you talk with the prisoner? Yes, did you talk about the king's supremacy of the church? Yes. What did you say? I said to him, supposing there was an act of parliament to say that I, Richard Rich, were to be king, would not you, Master Moore, take me for king? That I would, he said, for then you would be king. Yeah. Then he said... The prisoner? Yeah, yes, my lord. But I will put you a higher case, he said. How if there were an act of Parliament to say that God should not be God? This is true. And then you... Silence. Said... Continue. I said, ah, but I will put you a middle case. Parliament has made our king head of the church. Why will you not accept him? Well? Then he said... Parliament had no power to do it. No. Repeat no. the prisoner's no. words. He, he said, Parliament has not the competence. Uh, all uh, words to that effect. He denied the title. He did. In good faith, Rich, I'm sorrier for your perjury than for my peril. Do you deny this? Yes. My lord. If I were a man who heeded not the taking of an oath, you know well I need not to be here. Now I will take an oath. If what Master Rich has said is true, then I pray I may never see God in the face, which I would not say were it otherwise for anything on earth. That is not evident. Is it probable? Is it probable that after so long a silence on this, the very point so urgently sought of me, I should open my mind to such a man as that? Sir Richard, have you anything to add? Uh, nothing, Mr. Secretary. Sir Thomas? To what purpose? I am a dead man. You have your desire of me. What you have hunted me for is not my actions, but the thoughts of my heart. It is a long road you have opened. For first men will disclaim their hearts, and presently they will have no heart. God help the people whose statesmen walk your road. Then the witness may withdraw. I have one question to ask the witness. That's a chain of office you are wearing. May I see it? The Red Dragon. What's this? Sir Richard is appointed Attorney General for Wales. For Wales? Why, Richard, it profits a man nothing to give his soul for the whole world. But for Wales... And now I must ask the court's indulgence. I have a message for the prisoner from the king. Sir Thomas, I am empowered to tell you that even now... No, no, it cannot be. The case rests, oh, my lord. The jury will retire and consider the evidence. But considering the evidence, it shouldn't be necessary for them to retire. Is it necessary? No, my lord. Then, is the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Guilty, my lord. Prisoner at the bar, you have been found guilty of high treason. The sentence of the court... My lord. My lord, when I was practicing the law, the manner was to ask the prisoner before pronouncing sentence if he had anything to say. Have, have you anything to say? Yes. 
to avoid this, I have taken every path my winding wits would find. Now that the court has determined to condemn me, God knoweth how, I will discharge my mind concerning my indictment and the king's title. The indictment is grounded in an act of parliament which is directly repugnant to the law of God. The king in parliament cannot bestow the supremacy of the church because it is a spiritual supremacy. And more to this, the immunity of the church is promised both in Magna Carta and the king's own coronation. Oath. Now we plainly see that you are militia. Not so, Mr. Secretary. I am the king's true subject and pray for him and all the realm. I do none harm. I say none harm. I think none harm. And if this be not enough to keep a man alive in good faith, I long not to live. I have, since I came into prison, been several times in such a case that I thought to die within the hour. And I thank our Lord I was never sorry for it but rather sorry when it passed. And therefore, my poor body is at the king's pleasure. Would God my death might do him some good. Nevertheless, it is not for the supremacy that you have sought my blood, but because I would not bend to the marriage. Prisoner of the bar. You have been found guilty on the charge of high treason. The sentence of the court is that you shall be taken from this court to the tower, sent to the place of execution, and there your head shall be stricken from your body, and may God have mercy on your soul. I can come no further, Thomas. Here, drink this. Howard, my master had evil and gall, not wine, given him to drink. Let me be going. Father! 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 Mark, Mark, <laughs> have patience. <laughs> Trouble not thyself. Death comes for us all, even at our birth, even at our birth, death does but stand aside a little. It is the law of nature and the will of God. You have long known the secrets of my heart. <laughs> Sir Thomas, Archbishop, friend, be not afraid of your office. You send me to God. You are very sure of that, Sir Thomas. He will not refuse one who is so blithe to go to him. Thomas Cromwell was found guilty of high treason and executed on the 28th of July, 1540. Norfolk was found guilty of high treason and should have been executed on the 27th of January, 1547. But on the night of the 26th of January, the king died of syphilis and wasn't able to sign the warrant. Thomas Cranmer, that's the archbishop, was burned alive on the 21st of March, 1556. Oh, uh, Richard Rich became a knight and solicitor general, a baron and lord chancellor, and died in his bed. So did I. And so I hope will all of you. Marshall, shepherd of this far-flung flock that assembles regularly at this time and in this place.
to indulge in our mysterious devotions. While might may not make right, it can and often does make just about everything else. In a very real sense, the story of our alleged civilization is a story that has been created by armed men. Although the eminent Mr. Bulwer-Lytton may have said that the pen is mightier than the sword, it should be noted that he used a knife to sharpen his quill. And after all, when you come to think of it, our country, and practically every other country in the world, still spends more money for guns than for almost everything else put together. Any special orders today, Frank? Nothing. It's quiet. This should be one of them nice, peaceful days of policeman's delight. Yeah. I hope so, Frank. Anything wrong, Eddie? Well, uh, is it possible to know when the last day of your life has arrived? No, it isn't possible. I got this funny feeling. Yeah? Right now, if I close my eyes, I see myself walking the beach. A guy with a gun is running out of a store. I yell, halt. He turns, he shoots at him. You want to go on sick call? No. I get this feeling every day. Eddie, you're the most sensible guy in the precinct. Just a crazy feeling. And it always passes. Except today. Except today what? Nothing. Nothing. I'll be okay. I know. I know I'll be okay. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Just One More Day, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Theodore Bickell. His name is Edward Mason, and this is the early morning of a very special day in his life. To each of us, there comes a final day. From time to time. A last day. A day which marks a divide. And today is one of those special days for Eddie. Because it is the last day that Eddie will spend as a police officer. This is the 9,855th day that Eddie has been on the force. And it marks a total of 27 years. Every routine act that Eddie performs today is something that he will do for the last time. Checking in. Standing muster. Walking his beat, making his reports, and checking out. But today, there may be one act that Eddie will be called upon to perform for the very first time in 9,855 days. For the first time in 27 years. Morning, darling. What are you doing so early? Oh, I heard you stirring around. Sorry I woke you. So I figured I'd come out to the kitchen and put up the coffee. Yeah... Oh, what's the matter, Eddie? Oh, nothing. Same dream, huh? Yeah, same dream. Mm. I've been dreaming that dream now for, I guess, for the last six, eight months. But it's never been so real. <laughs> you know what you ought to do with that vivid imagination of yours, Eddie? I'm sitting in Mom's candy store, eating a dish of ice cream, vanilla, with strawberry syrup. You should become a writer, Eddie. I'm aware of how creamy white that ice cream is. And the strawberry syrup is red, like blood. Maybe go back to school. Take a writing course. Usually you don't dream in such sharp detail, you know. And then there's this kid. He's maybe 17, 18. One of the local punks. His name is Tommy. Comes running in. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, it's only a dream. He yells, there's a guy next door in D'Angelo's. He's got a gun. And I rush out of the candy store, and I hit the street. There's this guy with a gun in his hand, and I yell, halt. But he doesn't. He spins around and he fires. And what happens? I don't know. The shot. It's the loudest shot I ever heard in my whole life. Always wakes me up. Eddie, call in sick. Nope. Not on my last day. But you got the time off coming. Myra, honey, I'm going to put in my 27 years fair and square. Hey, turn on the radio. Let's hear the news. Oh, uh the radio? Yeah, the radio. Oh, I I can't. Why? What's the matter? It's uh, broken. It is? Mm-hmm. 
Well, I was getting up just before. I thought I heard it. Well, you did. But it, it, it just quit all of a sudden. Well, let me see if I can fix well, it. Well, take my word for it, Eddie. Come on, Myra. What is it you don't want me to hear? Now, Eddie... I'll know about it sooner or later. Well, I was hoping it would be later. Tell me what it was. Well, a cop was shot early this morning. A holdup in an all-night cafeteria. Who? Kohler. George Kohler. Did you know him? You knew him, too. His father was the first partner I had on the force, Henry Kohler. Oh. He hand me the phone book. Oh, okay. I think the kid was with the Southwest Precinct. Now, Eddie, I, I want you to listen to me. Uh, Southwest, here it is. Oh, Eddie, please, don't go in today. Eddie? Eddie, I'm afraid. Mara, take it easy. <sighs> Sergeant Rowland, I'm Patrolman Edward Mason with the 25th Precinct. About Georgie Kohler, I, I, uh... I called to see if he needs blood. Oh. Yeah, sure. Kid died an hour ago. Eddie. I think I better leave now. But you, you haven't even had your breakfast. Well, it's been the last day and all. I want to get in early. Eddie. Watch yourself. <laughs> you know... That's what you always say, and that's what I always do. You know, Eddie, I thought sure the captain was going to make a little speech this morning. About what? Oh, about this being your last day and all. Yeah, well, I asked him not to. I'll miss you, Eddie. I'll tell you. I think you're the best cop I ever knew. How come you wind up after 27 years just pounding the beat? I like the beat, Frank. You get to know the people, you get to be involved. That's where I disagree, Eddie. It's a job. All I want to do is put in my eight hours and get home. Especially now I'm getting married. Congratulations, Frank. Look at what she gives me for a wedding present. She says to me, honey, I want you well taken care of. <laughs> I must say an unusual gift, a revolver. How can you just call this a revolver? It's it, it, it's like calling the Mona Lisa a picture. It's a custom-made 38 special. That butt isn't mother of pearl. It's pure ivory. The engraving. It's a work of art. Feel the balance. Here, here, here trigger it. What do you say? All I can say is I wish we didn't have to carry guns. Are you nuts? How can you be a cop and not carry a gun? Cops don't carry guns in England. You're kidding. The cops there don't carry guns. So most of your criminals don't carry guns either. Look, Eddie, the very fact that you've got that revolver riding on your hip, don't it give you a, a, a sense of security? No. Oh, come on. All the times in the past 27 years that you had to go to the holster, where would you be if there was no gun there? But I've never gone to the holster, Frank. Never. What? That's right, Frank. Never. Are you telling me you've been a cop 27 years and not once in all that time did you ever have to draw your gun? In 27 years, I never have been forced to fire a single shot. I can't believe it. You... You got an arrest record as good as any man in the precinct. Some of your callers have been real rough characters. And you say you never went for the gun? I never once went for the gun. Why do you bag half of these guys? <laughs> been lucky, I guess. That has got to be the most single sensational streak of luck. And I only hope it'll go on for one more day. That's what I'm praying for, Frank. Just one more day. Hello, Tommy. Yeah. What do you want, copper? What do you want, Tommy? Well, it's a public street, ain't it? No, not exactly public. It's an alleyway used as a loading dock for this warehouse. You got any business here? Well, I'm just uh, passing through. You wouldn't by any chance be casing the joint. Me? Figuring on maybe a little break and entry tonight. Would you stop me like this if I was a rich old guy? Now, you see, it's the poor and the downtrodden that get pushed around by the law. Against the wall here, Tommy. What do you want to frisk me for? I'm clean. Not quite, Tommy. How about the ship? Well, I got to protect myself, don't I? 
The law will protect you, Tony. Well, I'll just hold on to this and you won't be tempted to get into trouble. Is that all, Santa Claus? Why don't you go back to school? Get yourself an education. Are you for real? It's the only way, Tommy. <laughs> You're breaking my heart. Don't you want to get anywhere? No, sir, not me. Why not? Well, I guess I'm like you, Eddie. Where did you ever get? You put in 27 years and you're still a uniform cop. Now, I can understand it if you were making money down here. But you, you're too dumb to even shake down the, the storekeepers. Okay, punk, beat it. I understand you're retiring tomorrow, Eddie, and all you got is your pension. And you're telling me to be smart? I said beat it. Well, good morning, Eddie. Good morning, Mom. Eddie, maybe you better come into the store for a minute. What is it, Mom? Well, I don't know. I got a funny feeling. You too? What do you mean, me too? What? Nothing. I was opening up the store this morning. You know, Benny's got the sciatica. Hey, did he go see the stock that I told you about? Did he ever go see a doctor in his life? So I just put out the papers on the stand and this man, a youngish man, oh, maybe 30 years old, he picks up a paper, throws down some money, walks away. What about him, Mom? I don't know. His face was familiar. In what way? Well, you know me, I'm always looking at the papers. I recognized him. Some gangster, you know? Gangster? Yeah, crook. A uh, hold-up man. I seen that face in the papers. But I can't remember the name. Wait, wait. In what connection would you have seen him in the paper? Well, like uh, maybe uh, a man uh, that escaped from jail. Try and think, Mom. I'll try. But it ain't no good. You know me, Eddie. Let something once fly out of my head and wild horses couldn't drag it back. And Benny, he says the same thing. But you know who could tell you? Who? This kid, Tommy. He eats breakfast with me here every morning. What can I do? The father's a drunk and the mother. Ugh. Tommy's seen him too. So I says to Tommy, I says, Tommy, do you know who that is? And he says, no, I don't. But I could tell by the way he said, no, I don't. The answer was, yes, I do. Tommy, huh? Mm-hmm. Maybe I can get it out of him. Ah, uh, Eddie, don't bother with it. What do you mean, don't bother with it? Well, in the first place, he ain't gonna tell you. And in the second place, it's your last day. On your last day, please, don't look for trouble. Come on in. Lucas, I heard you busted out of the slammer. How's your wagon? Let's get down to business, Chesco. That's what I like about you, Lucas. You're sociable. I called you because I need a wheel man and you're the best of us. I used to be modest, but <laughs> why fight it? You work 20, maybe 30 minutes. Tops. You get 25%. Of what? Come over by the window. Cross the street. On the corner, you got a candy store. Next to it. See the sign? D'Angelo's Jewelry. That's it. You mean you want to knock off a jewelry store, a little neighborhood ice parlor? <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you, Lucas. See you around, if the fuds don't bag you. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? What do you think he's got in there, a coin or a diamond for crying out loud? All right, say you can empty him out. What do you get? A bag full of cheap rings and watches and you got to fence every penny and pennies is all a fence will give you. I don't want what's on a counter or on the shelves. Oh, what do you want? What's in a safe. He's holding half a million bucks worth of uncut diamonds. How do you know? He's holding them for some guys that smuggle them out of South Africa. Where'd you get the tip? The guy's in jail with me. Done him a good turn, so he gave it to me. And I know where I can get a quarter of a million for the ice. You're cut 50 grand. You want me to keep talking? I'm all ears, Lucas. What time you got on your watch? Uh, 8.45. Right now. The cop on the beat's gonna walk out of the candy store. Watch. See? Yeah. There he goes. He's gonna go in the jewelry store. 
See? And he'll be there exactly two and a half minutes. How do you know? I've been watching this cop eight hours a day for more than a week. I know every move he makes. I know where he's going to be every minute. Now, that's good. Biggest problem you got on any job is a cop who comes blundering along out of nowhere. Don't you worry about this cop. He just ain't going to be no problem at all. After 9,855 days on the job, will Patrolman Eddie Mason finally have to draw his service revolver in the line of duty? The two gentlemen whose conversation we have just overheard would seem to be the type who could very well make him do it. I shall return shortly with Act Two. I am the master of my fate, says the poet. Not quite, answers the realist. And he would seem to have the best of the argument. The fact is, so much of our fate lies in the hands of others. Much of life is spent adjusting to or countering moves by other people. People who may neither know of nor care about our existence. Some of these may be good moves. Some are not such good moves. Particularly the ones being pondered at present by two young men who are peering out the window of a flat in a dingy tenement building. I have to hit the joint at exactly ten minutes to four. Why so late? At eleven minutes of, the cop goes into the candy store next door, and he has a plate of ice cream. I can even tell you what kind. Vanilla with strawberry syrup. Oh, you got to be out of this world, Lucas. Who could believe you? For the next eleven minutes, he's going to sit there, fanning the breeze with the old lady who runs the joint. Then, four on the head, he hits the street, and waits for his relief. You got this all clocked, huh? It's the only time of the day I got 11 clean minutes. 11 minutes to walk in there, show the old geezer the gun, get him to open a safe, hand me the bundle, you're parked outside, and we're off. How do you like it? I'd like it fine without the gun. What's the matter with the gun? I hate guns. Once they go off, you could never tell who gets hit. Without a gun, if you get caught, a good mouthpiece can reduce any robbery wrapped to maybe three to five. But get collared with the iron on you, you're looking at seven to ten. Kill somebody, you're buried for twenty or thirty. All I want that gun for is to scare him with. Okay. You see that fire plug twenty feet down a block? That's where I'll be parked so I can count on an open space. I'll come barreling out of there. Have that engine running. Nobody ever complained about my work yet. Look, you're getting 50 grand for this. And I'm worth every penny. So I'll be waiting for you any time between 3.50 and 4 p.m. See ya. Hey, where you going? Well, I got to steal a car. Nice little sedan. Okay, we got a deal. Yeah, we got a deal. As long as I don't hear no shooting. I am very nervous. I have been known to panic at the sound of gunfire. I forget why I'm there. I just hit that gas pedal and I fly. I said there won't be no shooting. How many times do I have to tell you? If you mean it, you only had to tell me once. Yeah, you okay, Eddie? Sure. 9.30 check-in. You sure you're okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll mark it. Frank, listen. Mom Feldman, where's the candy store? Yeah, what about her? She's not sure. She thinks she spotted somebody this morning. Who? Oh. She's not sure. Look, why don't you get hold of the latest wanted circulars and bring them down here? How about this one, Mom? Nah. Him, I'm sure it ain't. This one? Mm-mm. What about him? Hey, wait. Wait a minute. He's the person. Mom, you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. In the picture, he got short hair. Now, and now, it's down over his ears. But I'd know him anywhere, any time. By his mouth, tight, pulled up, like uh, something's always bothering him. Jack Lucas. Yeah, busted out of the state pen six weeks ago. Armed and very dangerous, Eddie. Be careful. 
I'm always careful, Frank. You always carry a big gun. Likes to use it. We better ask to have an extra car patrol the area. I'll tell you one thing, Eddie. You spot him, you want to shoot first and shoot fast. And remember. I remember. You see anything the least bit out of the way, call in. Okay, Frank. Thanks, Mom. My pleasure. Eddie, it's your last day. Why did you have... I have a job to do, ma'am. I remember reading the name. Jack Lucas. Mad Dog Jackie. And he's here, in the neighborhood. Uh, Who says he has to be here? Maybe... Maybe what? Well, maybe he was just passing by. He could be miles away from here by now. Mom, he's here. Ah, Eddie, makes sense. Why would he be here? What's here? He's here, Mom. Why do you think I am wrong, Eddie? (laughs) If I tell you, you'll you'll say I'm crazy. (laughs) Eddie, you crazy? (laughs) It's impossible. Today is, uh, well, the only thing I can think of to call it is, uh, today is the day of the gun. The day of the gun? Ah, now what is this, Eddie? The law of averages, Mom. The law of averages suddenly realizes that me, Edward Mason, has been breaking it far too long. Ah, now that sounds crazy. I know. So today we have to have the day of the gun to make up for all the days we didn't have one. I wouldn't want to talk this way to anybody but you, Mom. Uh, Eddie, what is this about a gun? Wherever I turn today, I'm looking down the barrel of a gun. Last night, I dreamed about a gun. This morning, a cop I knew since he was a kid is gunned to death. Yeah, I heard it on the radio. I come to work, and Frank makes a big deal out of his brand-new custom-made service revolver. A gift from his fiancée, no less. (laughs) What kind of gift? All right, each his own. And now we have mad dog Jackie Lucas, who I think was weaned on a gun. Yeah, but what does he want here? I think he wants me. Oh, what kind of talk is this? Does he know you? No, Mom. And I don't know him either. Ah, uh, then what are you saying? I'm saying I got this feeling I can't shake it. Just one more day. That's all I want. Just one more day. And I know, I just know, I can't have it. Listen, you say you saw this guy. Well, I... I could have been mistaken. Ah, uh, that doesn't help. If he's in the neighborhood, I have to know. Could Tommy have seen where he went? Could Tommy have seen? Yeah, sure. And I'll tell you why. Because when I asked Tommy if he knew the fella, Tommy went to the door and he looked. So, wherever he went, Tommy would have seen him. Yeah, thanks, Mom. For what? I upset you whole day. <laughs> How do you know it's Eddie? Oh, I was just sitting here wishing and hoping and praying you'd call. I guess it's what they call ESP. I just want to let you know, it's 12 noon and all's well. How do you feel? Just great. Oh, it's so hard to believe. You only have four more hours to be a police officer. We got to eat out tonight and celebrate. Mm-mm. We've been invited out. Yeah? By who? Oh, some old friends. Eddie? What is it? Um, I was going to suggest something, but I know you won't do it. Honey, you know I'd do anything for you. Well, I wish that you'd call in sick and come home right now. Ask me something else. (sighs) Eddie, watch yourself. That's what you always say, and that's what I always do. Well, look who's here. Mr. Junior Gangster himself. Uh, give me a chocolate malt, huh? I, uh, owe you a buck and a half for breakfast, so, uh, just take it out of this. Where'd you get ten dollars? I lifted a guy's wallet. I almost believe you. When are you gonna get a job? Well, I may pull one tonight. Oh, was it gonna end with you, Tommy? Eddie the cop wants to see you. Oh, yeah? Listen, Tommy... You remember that person we saw by a paper this morning? I didn't see no person. 
Do you know who he is? I don't know nothing. He is the one they call Jackie Mad Dog Lucas. I never heard of him. An escaped convict. A murderer. I can't prove nothing by me. Tommy, if a person like this is in the neighborhood, Eddie should know about it. A lot of things Eddie should know, but he's a chump. Eddie's a good cop. There ain't no such animal as a good cop. Don't you talk that way about Eddie. Was there ever a hungry person on this block? Eddie'd buy him groceries. And your own father. How many times does Eddie carry him upstairs when he's dead drunk? Why don't Eddie mind his own business and leave the old bum in a gutter? Tell me. You can't say that about your own father. Even if it's true? Believe me. Eddie's on your side. Hello, Tommy. Well, look who's here. All Santa Claus in a blue coat. Yeah, what happened to your whiskers? I want you to look at the picture on this circular. I'm glad to oblige, Glad, You know, support the local fuzz all the way. That's my style. Look familiar? Of course. That's the person you and I saw this morning, Tommy. I never seen him before in all my life. Okay. You walked over to the door to get a better look. Who did? You did. Well, I may have walked to the door because a good-looking dame was walking past. Which way did he go? Uh, which way did who go? The guy on the circular. The guy I'm looking for. Jack Lucas. How can I tell you which way you went when i never seen him? Okay, Tommy, have it your way. What do you mean, have it my way? What do you want from me? What am I, a cop? Am I supposed to go around looking for escape cons? I don't get paid to wear a badge. Why do I have to do your work? Maybe if you spent more time being a cop and less time hustling drunks out of the gutter and helping a bunch of deadbeats pay the rent and quit being Big Daddy and good old Uncle Eddie. Maybe if you spent more time being a cop, a real cop, you'd find him yourself. Now I'm getting out of here. What's a real cop? Tommy, sir. What they call a disturbed boy, Eddie. He doesn't respect me, Mom. Uh, don't say that. It's the truth. You are the best cop on the whole force. No. I'd be the best cop if I opened somebody's skull with a billy club or gunned down some crook. That's what he's been taught to respect. Eddie, he really looks on you as a father. That's no compliment. Well, just think. Tomorrow, you'll be a retired man. Yeah. But that's tomorrow. Meanwhile, I still got today. Just one more day. Long ago, a poet wrote, Be the day short or ever so long, It creepeth at last to even song. And the longest day for patrolman Edward Mason also creeps reluctantly to its close. But before it ends, finally, a certain event is scheduled to take place. And looking at it analytically, there are three possibilities. A, it will be canceled. B, it will be postponed. C, it will happen. I shall return shortly with Act Three. A dream is about to come true for patrolman Edward Mason. The trouble is, he doesn't know which dream. He has two of them. The first is that he'll be able to complete 27 years as a police officer without firing a shot in the line of duty. And the second dream is that he won't. It is now 2 o'clock in the afternoon of his last day on the force, and he has two hours to go. All 27 years are now compressed into two hours. 120 minutes. 7,200 seconds. And Eddie can feel the beat of each of them. Ah, Eddie. Mom says you wanted to see me, Jimmy. Eddie. Uh, look at you. I don't know. Should I laugh? Should I cry? Well, do both, Jimmy. See which you like better. Yeah. I cry because uh, 27 years, Eddie. Where did it go? Search me. But I laugh <laughs> because tomorrow you are a retired man, a free man. Uh, and then I cry 
Because I lose an old friend. How can you lose old friends? Eddie, we're going to have a wonderful dinner tonight. Tonight? No, uh, no. I think my wife said we were invited to... Sure, sure. We fixed it with Myra. There's going to be a big dinner in Clancy's restaurant for you. For me? Everybody's coming. Mama Feldman and Schmidt, the butcher, and Pedro and Jerry, the plumber, the whole neighborhood. Oh. It's supposed to be a surprise. Oh, I shouldn't have told you. Don't ask me why I told you. Okay, Jimmy, I won't ask you. I don't know why I told you. I don't know what got into me. I just want to make sure you knew how, how, how everybody here feels about you. Huh? It's just... Look, you're a cop. You understand. Any minute, some bomb, some, some gavone. You know how it is. I just felt I had to tell you. I understand. Uh, let me tell you the rest. You got to promise to act surprised when you get it, huh? When I get what? Yeah, I, I got it here in the drawer. Uh, it's a watch. Oh, hey, that's... Uh... See, see what I engraved on the back, huh? It's my finest work. To Edward Francis Mason, Eddie, a man of the law. <laughs> I'll put it back until tonight. Jimmy. What, uh, what do you got in that drawer? A revolver, Jimmy. What? Hey, I got a license for it. Why? Eddie, times have changed. I know, but you can't change them back with a gun. Nobody gonna come into my jewelry shop and hold me up. You wanna get killed? Jimmy, what's gotten into you? That gun, he won't settle anything. He'll maybe settle a few crooks. You show the gun, you force him to kill you. These animals today, they kill you anyhow. Believe me, Eddie, you're getting out just in time. You're not a cop for today. Promise me you won't do anything foolish. Uh, how can any human being make such a promise? Huh? Hey, Eddie. What's up, Frank? Nothing. Rose in the neighborhood. So's Rogers. Anyone spot anything? Not a smell. If Lucas is here, he's sacked up tight. I'll keep looking. Just think, Eddie. Forty more minutes, you're out of it forever. Why? Is it twenty after three already? As if you ain't clocking every second. I would say you're over the hump. Twenty after three. One more turn around the beat. And then I hand it over to Smitty. Between you and me, Eddie, I don't think Mom actually seen this mad dog, Lucas. But if she did, he was just passing through. Yeah, see you back at the station house. Okay. And Eddie, keep your eyes open, huh? Uh, give me a pack of cigarettes, huh? Uh, Tommy. Hmm? You want to come to the dinner tonight? Me? Pay five bucks to eat with a cop? I'll pay for you. Why don't you get off my back? Uh, who's bothering with you? And don't ask me if I've seen this guy. Who's asking? Because the answer is no. You got a phone boot? Uh, right in the back. Thanks. Chesco, I'm in a candy store. You set? You look out of the window with the black two-door hardtop near the fire plug, you'll see I'm set. Listen, I want to ask you something. Is there a chance somebody could have fingered you? What do you mean? I mean, your picture's been in the paper. You could have been spotted. No way. And what was the prowl guard doing outside? When? Two minutes ago. The cop in the car was talking to the cop on the beat. Have they been talking about you? No way. You didn't say nothing about prowl cars. I thought you had it locked. I do. That was the 320 checkoff. What 320 checkoff? 20 minutes after every hour, a car comes down the street. I told you. I know every move these clowns make. All right, I'm just checking. You make sure that motor's running and ready. And you make sure I don't hear no shooting. <laughs> Hot day, huh? Yeah. It's like yesterday it was winter, and today it's summer. What happened to spring? Don't ask me. 
What do you get for an ice cream soda? Forty cents. <laughs> I can remember when they cost a quarter. I can remember when I sold them for a dime. Forty cents, huh? But you get two scoops. Uh, give me a black and white. Ain't it a crime the way prices are sky high today? Yeah, where will it end? Beats me. Uh, Tommy. Hmm? I already paid the five dollars for Benny. I said I ain't going. I just talked to Benny on the telephone. He can't even get out of bed. Why should the money go to waste? I'd starve to death first. I'll see you, Mom. <sighs> Young people today. Yeah, no manners. Mm. We got a cop on the beat. Ah, such a wonderful man. I couldn't begin to tell you. We're giving him a retirement dinner tonight. And that one don't want to go. No respect. Hey, is that the right time on your clock? Absolutely. We said it by the radio. It can't be 347. My watch... My watch stopped. How do you like that? Never stopped before. I'll take it next door. We got a jeweler. Mr. D'Angelo. Uh, the man's a genius. Ah, Eddie. You're two minutes early. That your car parked outside? Yeah, it is, officer. You're kind of close to the fire plug. Got to be 12 feet away. Okay, officer, I'll take care of it. Thanks for telling me. Oh, uh, you can finish your soda. It's okay. I'm on a diet anyhow. Uh, what a nice young fellow. The usual? Yeah, might as well. Go easy on the syrup, though. Eddie, I can't tell you how glad I am the day is over. Yeah, it's just about over. And I made it. And I am so happy for you. I made it, Mom. But I cheated. What are you talking about? It's like a pitcher in baseball who's trying for a no-hitter. You know what I mean? From baseball, I know nothing. Well, the first couple of innings, he doesn't realize it. But as the game goes on, he becomes aware of it. I still don't understand. The gun thing, I mean. It's become bigger than anything else. It would make me different. Give me something to brag about. Ah. Uh... Eddie, don't be so tough with yourself. This uh, escaped gunman, Jack Lucas, I haven't really been looking for him. Well, you don't even know if he's around here. We know he's here, Mom. But you see, my record is more important to me than my duty as a cop. I don't want to find him. I don't believe you. I've been going through the motions. I haven't really been looking. You know why? Because if I find him, I know I'll have to shoot. So I'm sweating out 4 o'clock, and 4 o'clock is... Uh, Eight minutes away. <laughs> Eddie, you want to finish your career without using your gun. Not just for pride. I know myself, Mom. I know you better than you know yourself. You want to prove that a cop don't have to be a, a man as violent as the criminals. Except he wears a badge and he's got the right to smash heads. <laughs> How white the ice cream is and the syrup is blood red. Just like in a dream. What you're trying to tell everybody is, look, a cop can be kind and and understanding and a human being. I don't think I can eat it, Mom. Eddie, something the matter? Hey, Eddie. Yeah, what is it? Uh, you, you, you gotta... What do you want, punk? Uh, not nothing. You're gonna like the cop who's gonna walk this beat tomorrow. He's your kind of cop. Eddie... What is he? Don't say I told you. D don't ever say I ratted, but... But what? Next door. Next door in D'Angelo's. It's a stick-up. He, he's got a gun. Phone the station house, Mom. Help! 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 Or I'll fire! Eddie! Eddie? Yeah? It uh, was on the news. I heard Frank called me and, and the sergeant and Mom. Yes. D'Angelo. He's dead. Oh, no. You see, he was willing to give up the diamonds, but... But what, Eddie? He wouldn't let the hood take the watch. Oh. This watch. Read what it says. I know what it says. I killed the guy. I know. 
He fired first. That's what everyone says. He's 32 years old. Spent 12 years in jail. He had to end like this one day. He was searching for this day. He was waiting for it. That's right, Eddie. Listen, uh, I told the commissioner that since uh, I'm still under 50, I can put in 30 years instead of 27. All right, Eddie. They need me on that beach. You don't mind, Myra? I don't mind. They need you, Eddie. See what it says? To Edward Francis Mason. Eddie, a man of the law. Guys like you are few, far between. Nah, there's lots of guys like me. Guys who pray for just one more day. Well, just because I didn't get it, don't mean I have to walk out. I'll just start all over again. Just one more day. A modest enough request. There are so many days, so many uneventful days, so many dull days in which nothing happens. And yet, when Eddie Mason prayed for just one more of them, suddenly it became too precious a gift. I'll be back shortly. Because they come and go without effort, without notice, because one follows another swiftly and regularly, do not take your days for granted. Each is special. Each has its own meaning and its own place in the scheme of your life. Each one added to the other shapes the meaning of your existence. And hopefully, you will always be able to ask for and receive just one more day of whatever it takes to make you happy. Our cast included Theodore Bickell, E.V. Jester, Jackson Beck, Ken Harvey, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Hello, my name is Matt, and today I was supposed to get married to the girl I love more than anything else in the world. Her name is Angela. See, we, we were all at my bachelor party doing shots and... And then my buddy Mike, who I've known since we used to race tricycles together, whipped out some coke in the bathroom. I did four spoons and died right there in the stall. Cardiac arrest, they said. A heart attack. In the last second before I died, I thought of Angie. And how we had everything. How, how she'd start a sentence and I'd finish it. Or how our hands fit together when we held and the day we fell in love and the dunes at the beach and, and that we cried the night we got engaged and, and how she wanted boys and, and I wanted anything with ten fingers and ten toes how it was going to be Matt and Angie Angie from the Partnership for a Drug Free America this is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Columbia Broadcasting System presents The Free Company. For what avail the plow or sail, or land or life, if freedom fails?
This is W.B. Lewis, chairman of the radio division of the Free Company, which today presents a new play by James Boyd, author of Drums, Marching On, and Long Hunt. The Free Company is a society of writers, actors, and radio workers organized to prepare and to broadcast a series of radio plays dealing with American democracy. Plays by William Saroyan, Mark Connolly, and Robert E. Sherwood have already been presented. Plays to come will be written by playwrights, novelists, and poets of equal distinction, many of them Pulitzer Prize winners. Some of these plays will be concerned with one or more of the eight basic freedoms assured to every citizen in the Bill of Rights. Others, like today's drama, will cover the more general theme of freedom as it develops from those basic, vital rights. All are intended to explain and to illustrate the meaning of freedom, to supply in terms of our lives today answers to problems such as those faced by Abraham Lincoln when he said, We all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor. While with others, the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat, for which the sheep thanks the shepherd as his liberator, while the wolf denounces him for the same act as the destroyer of liberty. Plainly, the sheep and the wolf are not agreed upon a definition of the word liberty. <laughs> The Free Company presents Alan Dinehart, Betty Field, Elia Kazan, Sidney Lumet, Margot, Marlon McCormick, and Dorothy McGuire in One More Free Man by James Boyd. time shortly after Christmas in the year 1890. The place, a cow camp in the Rocky Mountains. A young mother is alone with her baby in the camp's log-built shelter. She came to the camp to spend Christmas with her husband, a mining engineer. They are snowed in, and her baby came at the blizzard's peak. But today, the road has been opened and a team has come up with supplies and a proper crib for the baby. Your fists are curled, and now you frown. What are you doing in your dreams? I know nothing about babies' dreams, but I know about mother's dreams. Since I first felt you stir, I, I dreamed about you. And when you came, I was so glad that, that the pain seemed only pain I dreamed. And still, the dream of you goes on. <laughs> Already I see that... That first warm day of spring, when the snow melts up into the sky and, and you and I drive down to town. Do you know on that first Sunday what we'll do? I can see it in my dreams. I, I can hear the organ. Baptized according to our word, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Therefore I baptize thee, John, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Was amen. that you that cried... You're sleeping. You were crying only in my dream. The water was cold on your head. But never mind. But now you have a name. Your name is John. No one will ever know any secret name for you, my manger baby. And when you go to school, you will be John. John Cross. In school. John Cross? Yes, ma'am? Who broke the window during 
recess? I couldn't say. You mean uh, you don't know? No, ma'am, I don't mean that. Well, did you? I couldn't say. I suppose you don't know that either. No, ma'am, but if everybody that didn't do it says so, then you'll find out who did. I have a right to find out. Not that way. Are you talking back to me? Yes, ma'am. That you'll stay in for two hours. But only mackerel teacher. What about the ball game? He'll miss the ball game. Oh, shucks, then I've done it. I broke it. Then you'll stay in for two hours. Okay, teacher. John, you're clear. Not at all. John will stay in for two hours, too, for talking back. That's not fair. Two hours tomorrow, the next day, too. You're not fair. Two hours more. Come now, John, this is foolish. If you'll apologize, I'll let you go to the ball game. I said what I thought. But that can sometimes be impudent. Come, say you're sorry, and you can go to the ball game. I said what I thought was right. Oh, go on, Johnny. Say it and get off. It don't mean nothing. No. All right, then. Two hours today, tomorrow, and the day after. That's how you'll be in school, perhaps. It will make life harder for you, my manger baby. But I wouldn't want it otherwise. There are plenty of boys otherwise. And are they happier? Some, perhaps. Am I not a natural mother? Mothers are supposed to wish their children safe and happy. But a boy like you, John, will not grow into a safe man. Or even a happy one. Unless you have good luck. A girl that you can always love. The only luck that lasts. What will she be like? And will I... Will I hate or envy her? Or will I be there to... to do either? It'll make no difference. They'll not think of me. Only of each other. Of... of themselves. As your father and I did just a year ago. Will the wedding be in... in a church like ours? Yes. Yes, in a church, I think. What is it, John? What's wrong? Nothing, nothing but this. Do you really love me? Darling, what a silly question. If you're not sure, you could still say so. I wouldn't think of such a thing. Oh, John, I think we're going to have a wonderful life. You're going to succeed. By next year, you'll be superintendent and we can take the house we looked at. You can say no still. Right now, I don't understand. John, you're crazy. Maybe you don't love me. I do love you. So much that I want everything to be good between us. I'd rather give it up than have it spoiled. Oh, silly. I'm lucky. All the girls envy me. But but inside, are you sure? Of course I am. Will she be big enough for you? And if not that, faithful enough at least. And if she's not, then who will be? The men you work with? You will be an engineer, I think. Like your father and like mine. But builders have no place for manger babies. I see bad times for you. Bad times in the hard, roaring world of engineers. Yes, what do you want? I'm John Cross, the super down at Black Rock. The GM sent for me. Uh, the general manager's expecting you. Go on in. Cross, what's this I hear? What do you hear? That you've been talking to the men. What do they say that Never I mind. Say? Never mind what they say or what you said. I'm your friend. Now, you've done a good job at Black Rock. Production's up. All I want is just a denial that you've been talking to the men. I've written it out. Sign here. I want to show it to the directors. It'll clear you. Don't read it. Just sign it. And whatever happens, let this be a lesson to you. Never talk to the men. What do they say that I said? They say you attended a meeting. That you told them that you would not lay a man off who tried to organize the mine as long as he got out the ore. I don't know whether that's true. I don't want to. I'm your friend. But I'm a busy man. Come on, now, sign here. I'll take care of it. That is what I told them. You know the company's policy. The minute we hear of a man organizing, we let him out and send his name to the association. Yes, I told them that. I told them, too, that they had the right to organize. I can't sign any denial. Cross, everybody makes mistakes, especially when he's green. Now, when you make one, the thing to do is to clear it up and then forget it. In this case, I'm making it easy for you. 
Why easy for me? Why? Well, I don't know. I guess it's because I see something in you. I see boys coming into the mines by hundreds. I size them up. I'm never wrong. You've got a future in this business, Cross. That's all I have to say, and it's much more than I've ever said to any other man. Now, sign here. It's not what I believe. Never mind that boy. Sign. These men have a right to better their conditions. Their houses are not fit to live in. There's too much break-off in the company store, too much dust in the working places. We're short on mine props and on ventilators. We're killing men. Slowly now, but someday we'll have a big disaster. (laughs) My boy, has it ever occurred to you that if a man's not satisfied, he can leave? Leave? With his family in a company house, with himself in debt to the company store? How leave? He didn't have to rent the house or run up a store bill, did he? Where else could he live? How else can he eat when times are slow? Well, that's his business. He can work it out to suit himself. This is a free country. Then he's free to organize. Cross, I've no time to argue. You've got a wife. Jobs or scares. You'll be on every blacklist in the country. Chief, we're killing men that might be saved. I've seen their bodies carried out. I know them, living and dead. And I'm for them. So, I've been trying to protect a radical. Smith, write a letter giving Cross notice and phone the head watchman at Black Rock not to let him on the property. Yes, sir. Young man, this is not my business. But I take to be your wife. A real man takes care of the woman he marries. I always understood. A real man does what he has to do. You're doing what you must, and I am too. Well, I guess there's no more to say. Goodbye and no hard feelings. Don't hold out your hand to me. I shake hands with no radical. Well, just goodbye then. Now, what will become of you? Your name is on the list. All doors are shut. And everywhere you go, you bear the brand of troublemaker. A name they give to those who speak the truth. And what will that pretty wife of yours now have to say? I think I... I know what she will say in your cheap rooming house. With a leaky stuff. Well, did you find anything? No, they'd heard about me. What are we to do? Look at my dress. Look at my hands. Oh, Mary, Mary, I see them. All the time. Wherever I go, whenever they turn me down. Why didn't you think of them at Black Rock, then? Mary. You could have signed the letter and would be there and going up, not down. But the men were right. I explained that. What's right? What's wrong? And are they better off? Look at us. And all because you can't learn to keep quiet. Keep quiet is not something a man learns. Something he forgets. He forgets how he was as a kid. Kids don't keep quiet. They say what they think. Then something happens to them and they forget. (laughs) Is that philosophy? Well, I can't live on it. I'm going home. Oh. I guess that's best. This is no place for you. Then, when I get a job, I'll come for you. Is that your bag? Yes, and it's packed. I got supper for you. Packed? Don't look at me like that. I got your supper, didn't I? But, Mary, you could wait a day or two. Something might turn up. Oh, we've said that 50 times. I must hurry if I'm going to catch my train. Come on. Yes. Yes, I'll take you to the train. Oh, Mary, Mary. No, let me go, John. I must hurry. Go get my bag. Come on. Yes, you mustn't miss the train. You think she'll come back to you? Or even wait? A girl with her bright beauty fading with not much time to lose. And all the brisk young men around, so confident and careful. No, my son, someday you'll learn the truth. And then for you, the name of loneliness will have a meaning all its own. And you will be a wanderer in the dark places of the earth. But work, work you must. And work perhaps you will among the workers. The workers you work to save. 
meeting will come to order. This meeting of Local 1634 is called for the election of officers and delegates to the National Convention. Nominations are now in order. I renominate our president, Tony Seeker. I second the nomination. I move the nominations be closed. Well, brothers, it looks like I was in again. I'm much obliged. Well, the chairman. The chair recognizes Mr. Cross. This election is not in order. There was no time for other nominations. All right, bright boy. Is there any other nominations? You see, bright boy? Now sit down. I want to speak on the nomination. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let him speak, let him speak. Okay, bright boy, go right ahead. Ever since I joined this union, I've seen how it's run. It's run by seagulls. So in my spare time, I looked around to see how Seagull runs it. Here's what I found. Last spring, we struck in violation of our agreement. We lost 28 days' pay in the goodwill of the town. Who cares for goodwill? Ain't the employers chipped us plenty? We lost our wages, but Seagull didn't lose. Ever since then, he's been taking down a hundred bucks a month from the employer to keep us working. That's a lie. I have proof. Where is it? Not here, Seagull. Not where it can be snatched out of my hands by your gang. But I'll produce it when I'm ready. And I'll produce another piece of paper. Seagull's real name's not Seagull. What is it? Oh, what is it? But I know. I know what it is. And what he did. Seagull's no working man. The only job he ever did, he got six years for. What? Living off girls. Oh, Seagull, am I right? <laughs> Now, here's my office, Ego. Resign and take your mob out of the hall and let us have a free election. Ego, <laughs> resign or I'll turn you in. So you came in here, we had a nice little local, everything quiet and regular. But since, at every meeting, you got a new squawk, don't we mean to stick by our agreement? Why won't we show a financial settlement? Is it right to restrict production? That's what I asked, and I never got an answer. And never will while I'm here. That's why I want you out. This is no labor union. It's just a gang that lives off the employers and off the union members. There's you. You and your mob. Not one of you are workers. The rest of the crowd here, the workers, are all right, but they're scared to move. They've got their bread to think of. They've got their wives and kids. You used to live off girls. Well, we're the girls you live off now. Brothers, I guess you can see his racket. He wants to frame me and get the job. I'm not a candidate. What are you then, bright boy? I'm just a guy. Says what he believes. And what do you believe? We've heard you talk a lot, but never found out yet. I believe that people have got to take care of themselves. Well, ain't we doing it? Yes, you are. But not us. Listen, boy. To take care of himself, the worker's got three things. He's got his fists, or scabs, and face. Listen to him, brothers. He'll be punching himself in the jaw, maybe. All right, go on. He's got his skill. He's got his skill that the world can't do without. And he's got the backing of public opinion. Those are his weapons, and he needs them all. Well, now that we heard, now that we heard your little Sunday school lesson, sit down. I'll not sit down. Listen, listen. Listen, you American workmen. We're American workmen no matter where we started from. Where does this local stand today? Have we any respect like good unions? Any public support to back us in a fight? Does this town trust us to stick by our agreements? Do they feel about us the way Junction City feels about their local there? We've thrown away our weapons. Now look, men. Why does the name of the American workman stand high all around the world? Because he's the man that turns out the stuff. That's his ace in the hole, his blue chip. He can turn out the stuff. So I say, let's clean up, start right. If the employers treat us fair, be tough but square and turn out the stuff. If they're in trouble through no fault of their own, help them keep going if we can and turn out the stuff. Then if they jip us, strike with the town behind us and they'll know they're losing men that can turn out the stuff. <laughs> Well, that's 
beautiful. Beautiful and true. It's what my father used to say. Now they listen. Now they're cheering, but but will they act? Time is the enemy of all things good. The enemy until it has destroyed them. Then when it's too late, it turns and preserves the ruins. Preserves them through generations. Generations in the minds of men. But, but I must watch my dream until it ends. And it will end, perhaps, where water flows like fate and time. And great ships sleep in darkness. By the dark. Who's that? It's me, John. Benny. What are you doing here? You oughtn't to go alone at night. Not by the docks. We were pointed some of the boys to watch you. We tipped off the cops to watch out, too. What do you mean, appointed? We had a meeting, all the right guys. We're going to throw Seagull out and put you in. We don't want nothing to happen to you, see? Pick somebody else. There's plenty. We've done our picking. Now listen. Keep out of these dark places, will you? Why make it tough for us to cover you? All right, maybe you're right. One thing more. We've been a bunch of heels, see, with this seagull. We ain't proud of it, you understand, but most of us got kids, see? I guess you don't know what that means. No. I've got no wife, no kids. But I know what it means. But get this right. From now on, we back you. Boys are all right, you understand? Only sometimes it takes somebody to give them a right steer. Now, let's get out of this. Uh, listen, what's that? Somebody in a big hurry. Look out, it might be Seagull. Look out. Yeah. John! Did I get you? John! John, can you talk? I can't get to you. They got me too. Can you hear me, John? Hang on, fella. That's the end. Over here, Doc. Hurry. Uh, who else got it? Just him and me. Look at him. Who's this way? I'm the driver. I'll fix you up till the doc gets around to you. You got here quick for once. Yeah, here, roll over in this blanket. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we heard the shooting. Knew just where we'd find you, buddy. Too bad you didn't know sooner. Some of you cops could have got Seagull then. Uh, they got him. Oh, they did? Yeah, they blocked him off coming out of third, and they cut him down just before we came by. Him and three with him. Didn't you hear it? That's Seagull and Jack and Red and one arm. Doc, did you look them over? Yeah. Well, for Pete's sake, Doc, I, I mean, he's a friend of mine. He'll never walk again. The spinal cord. You mean he'll be no good for nothing? I mean, it's his legs. Only his legs. His other end's all right. Okay, then, Doc, okay. That's the end we need. now, between this manger and the magic northern lights, by wishing I could make my dream come true, or not come true, what would I say? I am a daughter of the pioneers, strong men, brave women, free daring men, who worked, took chances, and winning, losing, made this land. What would I say? I'd say then, let the dream come true. Out of my nameless body, let there come a man who speaks the truth he knows. One more free man to make his country great. 
Are you hungry, my baby? Come. Come then now, come. It's time for you to eat. Out of my body you have come. Out of my body you grow strong. Be happy now. And eat. And sleep. And dream. And then, whatever lies ahead, Go on. What is the meaning of Mr. Boyd's play for us? How does it touch our own lives? Here's how. We are citizens of one of the few remaining countries on the face of the globe in which the John Crosses of this world may still escape the concentration camp and the quicklime grave. John Cross had a compulsion to speak the truth and to act the truth. There are many such men, and there have been many such men in our past. William Penn and Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, Sam Houston, Lincoln, all were men like John Cross. The meaning of our freedom is this, that here in our land, men like John Cross shall win in the end. John Cross may suffer because American democracy, being human, is not perfect. There is always a gap between what our people believe and what they do. Men like John Cross break their bodies and their hearts trying to close that gap. Then others follow. And so another gain in man's long struggle to be free is made secure. We should be proud that we have a land where men and women still are free to lead and others are free to follow. A land where men and women stand for what is decent and just. Where all our citizens have the right, by law and by our great tradition, to make their fight for a better world. Let us again, in this present time of crisis, Renew our timeless and high resolve that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. In today's free company presentation, you've heard Margot as the mother, Dorothy McGuire as the teacher, Sidney Lumet as John Cross, the schoolboy, Marlon McCormick as the elder John, Betty Field as Mary, Alan Dinehart as the general manager, and Elia Kazan as Seagull. The stars and author of today's play contributed their services without payment, as did Bernard Herman, who composed and conducted the music, and Norman Corwin, who directed the production. All those who enjoyed James Boyd's play will be glad to know that a complete copy of the broadcast has been printed for listeners. For ten cents, the cost of printing and mailing, you may receive your copy. Write to The Free Company in care of the Columbia Broadcasting System in New York. Copies of subsequent Free Company plays will be made available each week as the series goes on. Next week, the Free Company will present Freedom's a Hard-Bought Thing by Stephen Vincent Bonet, adapted by David Eskind. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Just try vaccine when sunburn leaves skin inflamed and peeling. It helps take out the painful fire, gives soothing, cooling feeling.
One Man's Family, brought to you, transcribed, by Miles Laboratories, makers of Alka-Seltzer, Bactine, and many other fine, dependable pharmaceutical products. Overheard between Hazel and Jack on the back steps. Come here, Mr. Law Partner. I want to congratulate you. Well, thanks, Hazel. How does it feel to be a man of distinction? <laughs> About the only difference I've noticed is that I've got more responsibility and less cash. Mm-hmm. So that's how it is with the barbers today. I want to talk to you mothers about the meals you serve your family. Oh, I'm sure you're a good cook, and you enjoy fixing the foods your family likes best. But, you know, just giving your family the food they like to eat may not be enough. Your job is bigger than that, Mother. You must make sure they're getting all of the known essential vitamins they need as well. And you can do this by seeing that they take one-a-day brand multiple vitamins. Yes, these quality vitamins by the makers of Alka-Seltzer will give the folks in your family the vitamin protection they should have for constant good health. One-a-day brand multiple vitamins are easy and pleasant to take, low in cost, and excellent as protection against vitamin deficiency disease. Ask your druggist for them. One-a-day brand, multiple vitamins. The blue package with the big one. Chapter 6, Book 86. The day is waning as Henry Barber comes up from his garden in his work clothes. He is pleasantly tired from his efforts and sits down on the back steps. The late sun is adding its color to his flowers, and here and there a shadow has fallen to underscore the vivid hues. Apparently, Henry approves of nature's collaboration with his handiwork, for he is nodding in satisfaction and chuckling to himself as he looks engrossedly at the prospect below him. Yeah, yeah. Well, Father. Oh, Hazel, I didn't see you standing there. I know you didn't. What are you doing, admiring your garden? Beautiful now, isn't it? See how the sun is just touching the tops of the flowers. Eh? It's lovely. Where's Mother? She's in the house someplace. I brought some snapshots we took of Pinky. I just picked them up at Mr. Jameson's drugstore. Dan took most of them, and they came out very well. You want to come in and see them? Yeah. I told Mother I'd bring them over as soon as they were finished. I've got some extra prints. I'll leave them for you. Very good, very good. Go ahead, my dear. Hi. Huh? Jack just drove in next door. Hello. How was the trip to San Diego? Come here. I want to congratulate you. Huh? I haven't seen Jack since he was made a partner. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a full-fledged partner now, eh, hey, Jack? What's that, Dan? Father was just boasting about your promotion. Oh. Well, tell me, Hazel, how'd you find things in San Diego? Pinky and Admiral yet? The first thing I want to do is to give you a big kiss of congratulations. Come here. I thought everybody had done that already. Well, I haven't. We left the San Diego before I got to see you. Bend down here and be kissed, Mr. Law Partner. Mmm. <laughs> Thanks, Hazel. <laughs> How does it seem to be a man of distinction? Well, about the only difference I've noticed so far is that I've got more responsibility and less ready cash. Oh, no. <laughs> the office staff, the rent, all that is part of Jack's worry now. Hey, my boy? Sure is, Dan. Hey, come in the house. Hazel has some snapshots to show us. Well, I haven't checked in at home yet. I think I'd better run along. All right, Jack. I'll leave the pictures with Mother, and you can see them later. Good. Think he's okay, is he? Oh, yes, he's quite the sailor man. He expects to be assigned to some kind of duty almost any day now. He said he'd requested submarine service. Huh? Submarine? Well, that's what he said. Well, that's pretty rugged. You'll have to get a lot more training for that. I know. I think he was trying to impress Dan and me. I don't really believe he'll go into that. Of course, those submarine boys get a lot more pay. Maybe that's what Pinky had in mind. That would influence him, no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Leaving San Diego very soon. I don't let myself dwell on that too much. The thought of his going off to sea gives me cold shivers. No. He seems so young somehow. He looks so little and boyish standing there waving at us as we left. Yes, yes. Well, come on, Father. Let's go in the house. I haven't much time left. I've got to get home. I left Margaret watching our dinner. It might be burned up by the time I get there. She gets on that phone, you know, and forgets everything. Hmm. I'll see you later. Well, well my boy. Uh, go ahead, Hazel. Oh, wait, I, I'll get the door. Bye, Jack. Say hello to Betty. Okay. Oh, hi, Paul. Hi, Jack. Wow, what'd you do? Pick up a ride, Cliff? Yeah. Yeah, Paul came by just to get off a streetcar. Yeah, good thing, I guess. He was dragging a little. 
How are you, Jack? Hi, Paul. I wish I could time it out every night this way so I could get picked up. Walking home, those last couple of blocks kind of get me. I always keep my eye open for you, but we never seem to meet up, Cliff. Well, of course, being a big partner now, you'll be keeping banker's hours before long. Knock off at three or four o'clock. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Just the other way around, huh, Jack? You're not kidding. Well, I got to get through the hedge and report to my little wife. I'll see you guys later. Okay, so long. Well, hmm? Hmm? Jack. I'm getting to be a solid character, you know it. Yeah, he is at that. Partner in a big law firm. It's hard to believe, in a way. Why? Oh, I don't know. He's always been our kid brother. And here he is getting up in the world. Probably be a big success one of these days. Mm, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Mm, funny how things turn out. If anybody told me a few years ago I'd be selling neckties at my age, I'd have thought he was crazy. Now, look. <laughs> sure got a great future in front of me. And, oh, gosh, I... I'm getting on in years, Paul. <laughs> you got a long way to go before you catch me. Oh, yeah, but it's it's different with you somehow. Why? Oh, you've done something with your life, but here I am, just treading water. Why, do you realize it'll only be a question of a few years before I'll be a, a grandfather, probably? What are you talking about? You got a son 13. That's a long way from being a grandfather. Be nine or ten years at least before Andy gets married. Mm, maybe I'll have more sense by the time I'm a grandfather. No kidding, though. Won't that be something? For up there. Ooh, feel old as Methuselah. <laughs> well, come on, Grandpappy. Okay, Eli. you think it's funny. We'll both be great and uncles or great uncles or whatever you call them inside of another year or so. I'll take a bet on that. Oh? And who's to present us with our little grandniece or nephew, as the case may be? Joan. Huh? Gives you that idea. Well, now, look, son, you can't tell me she isn't serious with this fellow she's been going with over there in Berkeley. Something is certainly going on. She's taken awful close over there, and in my book, that is love. Isn't that gorgeous, Jim? See, the sun's coming up. All gold. Oh, I just love looking down from the Berkeley Hills like this. Mm-hmm. The setting sun and music at the close. It's the last taste of sweets, his sweetest last... Go on. I like that. <laughs> don't remember anymore, Joan. What's it from? Uh, Richard II, isn't it? I don't know. You like Shakespeare? I do, strangely enough. It's sort of odd for a fellow in engineering to like something like that, I guess. Oh, I don't think it's odd. I think it's nice. Do you? Yes. You know, Jim, you remind me of my Uncle Paul. Your tastes are a lot the same, and... Well, I, I just know you're going to like each other. Uh, he sounds like a grand guy from what you told me about him. Oh, he is. He... He's, he's so understanding and warm and sympathetic. If I had him come over here for dinner sometime, do you suppose you could possibly come? Well, uh, I don't think he can count on me, Joan. You mean because of your wife? Yes. Why don't you tell me about her, Jim? I will, sometime. Have you told your Uncle Paul or anybody in your family that you were... Well, that you were seeing a married man? No, I haven't told anybody. Why should I? <laughs> Silly of me to ask that. I know you well enough now to know that you wouldn't say anything. It wouldn't be helped by talking about it. And I don't worry anymore that you don't love me. You do. I know you do. Joan, I'm afraid we're going to have to go. Oh, it, it's so lovely here on this hill. So peaceful. The sun's almost gone. It'll be getting cold. Are you saying that because you want to go? It isn't that I want to, but... but I'm afraid I'll have to pretty quick now. All right. You say when, and we will. I understand. Joan. Yes? I was full of good intentions when I met you this afternoon. There were so many things I was going to tell you. Tell me now. Shall I? Yes. We mustn't see each other anymore. Why? I've tried to stay away from you. I've, I've tried to put you out of my mind. I've avoided going to the library at the times when I knew you'd be there, but... But I, I always end up by coming back, looking for you, waiting for you. If you didn't, I'd find you, Jim. I know every class you have. I know where you are practically every hour of the day. I know just how you look when you're taking notes in class. I can see the way you wrinkle your forehead a little when you're thinking. The way your hair is always kind of mussed and how you hold a fountain pen. A smudge of ink on your finger. I see you all the time. All day long, e even when you're not with me. Night, when I go back to my apartment, I, I lose you. I try not to think of you then because you're with... 
Jim. Jim, you know how much I love you. John, it's no good. We mustn't see each other anymore. You know that. Oh, please. Please don't. What? If I thought I wasn't going to be with you anymore, I... That would just be the end of everything, that's all. What a heel I was not to have told you right in the very beginning, but that I... What the situation was... Do you think that would have made any difference? I loved you the very first moment I saw you. I mean it. You could have told me you were married or a criminal or anything, and I wouldn't have cared. And I don't care now. But we've got to care, Joan. And it's much better that we end this now before... Before what? I can't tell you how I blame myself for letting this get where it is. But the only way, the, the best way to make amends for my selfishness and thoughtlessness is to end it. Finally and definitely. Jim, answer me one question. Yes. Do you love your wife? Listen, Joan, I, I love you. Because I do, I don't want any harm to come to you. If we go on, it may. The Barbers will be back in just a moment. For half an hour, Jack Barber has been explaining the meaning of the word good to his little daughter, Mary Lou. You understand now, don't you, honey? Well, maybe, but why? But I've just told you, Mary Lou. Did you tell me why I couldn't say good, gooder, gooder? I told you it's not right. Is that a reason? Of course it is. We don't say good, good, or goodest, but we do say what? What did I just tell you? Good, better, best. That a girl. <laughs> How'd we get started on this anyway? Because I said my dolly doesn't feel good, and I'm going to put her to bed. No, well, honey. Your dolly doesn't feel well. That's how we got started. That's what you said before. Oh, well, we won't go over it again. But I heard you say it just last night, too. You heard me say what? That you didn't feel good. And that's when Mama fixed you a glass of bubbles. Oh, you mean the Alka-Seltzer for my headache. Well, that was certainly good. You bet. Alka-Seltzer is always good for a headache. And here's how you can find out for yourself just how good it is. Get a package of Alka-Seltzer from your drugstore. And next time you feel miserable with a headache, take Alka-Seltzer. You'll be delighted with the fast, comforting relief it brings. Alka-Seltzer contains one of the world's most effective pain relievers, ready to go right to work, ready to bring you the relief you want. Remember, that's Alka-Seltzer for really fast, really effective headache relief. Here's the family again. Come on, Joan, we've got to start back toward the campus. When am I going to see you again? I said it was dangerous. Did you understand? Yes. I understood, Jim. When am I going to see you again? Remember, friends, when a headache is cutting down your efficiency or making you feel droopy and irritable, take Alka-Seltzer for relief. Just drop one or two Alka-Seltzer tablets in a glass of water... Let it fizz and bubble up. Then drink that sparkling, refreshing solution. Alka-Seltzer contains one of the world's most effective pain relievers. And it's instantly ready to go to work to bring you the relief you need and want. Get Alka-Seltzer at any drugstore. Always keep Alka-Seltzer on hand for fast headache relief. Fast-acting headache relief. One Man's Family is brought to you every weekday night at this time, transcribed by Miles Laboratories, makers of Alka-Seltzer. Tomorrow, The Missing Ring, Chapter 7, Book 86. This is a Carlton E. Morse production, directed by Michael Raffetto. The Railroad Hour presents Very Warm for May, tonight on NBC. To Them Who Trust in Fortune by Thomas More Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Thou that art proud of honour, shape, or kin, That heapest up this wretched world its treasure, Thy fingers shined with gold, Thy tawny skin with fresh apparel, Garnished out of measure, 
and weenest to have fortune at thy pleasure cast up thine eye and look how slippery chance eludeth her men with change and variance sometimes she looketh as lovely fair and bright as goodly venus mother of cupid she becketh and she smileth on every white but this cheer feigned may not long abide there comes a cloud and farewell all our pride like any serpent she beginth to swell and looked as fierce as any fury of hell yet for all that we brittle men are fain so wretched is our nature and so blind as soon as fortune list to laugh again with fair countenance and deceitful mind to crouch and kneel and gape after the wind not one or twain but thousands in a rout like swarming bees come flickering her about then as a bait she bringeth forth her ware silver and gold rich pearl and precious stone on which the amazed people gaze and stare and gape therefore as dogs do for a bone fortune at them laugheth and in her throne amid her treasure and wavering riches proudly she heaveth as lady and empress fast by her side doth weary labour stand pale fear also and sorrow all bewept disdain and hatred on that other hand eke restless watch from sleep with travail kept his eyes drowsy and looking as he slept before her standeth danger and envy flattery deceit mischief and tyranny about her cometh all the world to beg he asketh land and he to pass would bring this toy and that and all not worth an egg he would in love prosper above all thing he kneeleth down and would be made a king he forceth not so he may money have though all the world account him for a knave lo see ye thus divers heads divers wits fortune alone as divers as they all unstable here and there among them flits and at a venture down her gifts they fall catch whoso may she throweth great and small not to all men as cometh son or dew but for the most part all among a few and yet her brittle gifts long may not last he that she gave them looketh proud and high she whirleth about and pluckth away as fast and giveth them to another by and by and thus from man to man continually she used to give and take and slyly toss one man to winning of another's loss and when she robbeth one down goeth his pride he weepeth and waileth and curseth her full sore but he who receiveth it on t'other side is glad and blesseth her oftentimes therefore but in a while when she loveth him no more she glideth from him and her gifts they too and he her curseth as other fools do alas the foolish people cannot cease nor void her train till they the harm do feel about her alway busily they press but lord how he doth think himself full well that may set once his hand upon her wheel he holdeth fast but upward as he steereth she whipth her wheel about and there he lieth thus fell julius from his mighty power thus fell darius the worthy king of persia thus fell alexander the great conqueror thus many more that i may well rehearse thus double fortune when she list reverse her slippery favour from them that in her trust she flieth her way and lieth them in the dust she suddenly enhanceth them aloft and suddenly mischieveth all the flock the head that late lay easily and full soft instead of pillows lieth after on the block and yet alas the most cruel proud mock the dainty mouth that ladies kissed have she bringeth in the case to kiss a knave in changing of her course the change showeth this up starts a knave and down there forth a knight the beggar rich and the rich man poor is hatred is turned to love love to despite this is her sport thus proveth she her might great boast she makes 
if one be by her power wealthy and wretched both within an hour poverty that of her gifts will nothing take with merry cheer looketh upon the press and seeth how fortune's household goeth to wreck fast by her standeth the wise socrates aristippus pythagoras and many a leash of old philosophers and eke against the sun baketh him poor diogenes in his tun with her is bias whose country lacked defence and whilom of their foes stood so in doubt that each man hastily gan to carry thence and asked him why he nought carried out i bear quoth he all mine with me about wisdom he meant not fortune's brittle fees for nought he counted his which he might lease heraclitus eke list fellowship to keep with glad poverty democritus also of which the first can never cease but weep to see how thick the blinded people go with labour great to purchase care and woe the other laughed to see the foolish apes how earnestly they walk about their japes of this poor sect it is common usage only to take that nature may sustain banishing clean all other surplusage they be content and of nothing complain no niggard eke is of his good so fain but they more pleasure have a thousandfold the secret draughts of nature to behold set fortune's servants by them an ye wall that one is free that other ever thrall that one content that other never full that one in surety t'other like to fall who list to advise them both perceive he shall as great difference between them as we betwixt wretchedness and felicity now have i showed ye both choose what ye list stately fortune or humble poverty that is to say now lieth it in your fist to take here bondage or free liberty but in this point and ye do after me draw ye to fortune labour her to please if that ye think yourself too well at ease and first upon thee lovely shall she smile and friendly on thee cast her wandering eyes embrace thee in her arms and for a while put thee and keep thee in fool's paradise and forth with all whatso thou list devise she will grant thee it liberally perhaps but for all that beware of afterclaps reckon ye may never of her favour sure you may in clouds as easily trace an hair or in dry land cause fishes to endure and make the burning fire his heat to spare and all this world in compass to forfare as her to make by craft or engine stable that of her nature is ever variable serve her day and night as reverently upon thy knees as any servant may and in conclusion that thou shalt win thereby shall not be worth thy service i dare say and look yet what she giveth thee to-day with labour won she shall haply to-morrow pluck it again out of thine hand with sorrow wherefore if thou in surety list to stand take poverty's part and let proud fortune go receive no thing that cometh from her hand love manner and virtue they be only though which double fortune may not from thee fro then mayst thou boldly defy her turning chance she can thee neither hinder nor advance but an thou wilt needs meddle with her treasure trust not therein and spend it liberally bear thee not proud nor take not out of measure build not thine house on high up in the sky none falleth far but he who climbeth high remember nature sent thee hither bear the gifts of fortune count them borrowed ware End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.